Hello and welcome to the second episode of the Orthodoxy, Autocracy and Nationality series. Today we're going to be talking about the Roman conquest of the Greek world, starting off at the Pyrrhic Wars and taking us all the way through to the last war of the Roman Republic and the suicide of Cleopatra. I'm very lucky as always to be joined by Columba. Hello guys. And by Marcus again. Good evening. How are you both this evening? Well, I'm doing well. The weather's been a little bit less atrocious the past couple of days, so so we're we're recovering. <laughs> yeah, the weather's and, been uh, a bit. Uh, sorry, Marcus. I know. I was just going to say, no, all is well uh, in Australia, so I can't complain. Yeah, the weather's been a bit temperamental here, but um, I'm sure people didn't tune in to listen to the weather. <laughs> um, ap <laughs> ap apologies, um, all again for this um this new time. Um, you know, a couple of unavoidable problems on Monday, so um. This will be the regular Monday podcast we today, and we will be doing a podcast on Virgil tomorrow, and hopefully it won't conflict too much with um, Econ Chat over on Radlib's channel. So getting into it, I thought a good time to start would be the Pyrrhic Wars. So do any of you have anything to say on the, the build-up or the context behind the Pyrrhic Wars? Um, so the build-up um, was basically a part of Rome's... Um, Rome's expansion into the south of Italy, what gets called Magna Graecia, and there was a city called um, um, Tarentum. I believe there was um, there was a conflict going on in Tarentum because some mercenaries had taken over the city, and they appealed to um, Pyrrhus in Epirus, which is um, on the west coast of Greece, for aid. And um, that seems to be how the war began. I think this was, this was in um, um, two eight two. The um, Tarentines had sank um, a couple of Roman vessels. And so then a Roman um, consul, I think Balbulus, um, moved moved into Tarentum and um, started, you know, ravaging the territory. And I think um, two eight one, and uh, that's 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 how the war began. Yes, I think just just a tiny bit of like introduction before then. Um, the Romans have been expanding quite aggressively from four hundred until three hundred, and just before the. Um, war with um the tarentines there was of course the samnite war so um there were a lot of unhappy factions within the roman empire which had just recently been conquered um in terms of um tarentum itself i believe um the tarentines had also attacked a, another greek colony in magna Graecia, uh known as the thurii um for ostensibly preferring or having an alliance with the romans which which again sort of gave the romans even more of a casus belli to attack tarentum and as you mentioned it was the um invitation to um to pyrrhus that set up the pyrrhic wars and you know he wanted to come and um and again his um his like pr previous life is quite interesting how um he was part of again the extended um war of the diadochi which you know carries on quite nicely from um our discussion last week um he Weirdly enough, again, he's he actually runs quite a, a minor kingdom in the grand scheme of things. You know, Epirus is really quite a backwater when compared to um, the Achaeans or Attica or Boeotia or Thessaly or Macedonia at the same same time. Nevertheless, you know, Pyrrhus is considered one of the last sort of great generals in the mold of Alexander. So, um, in terms of again giving you sort of an overview of the chronology, we've already mentioned that this involves the Roman expansion into Magna Graecia, which is um, I just bring the the map up quickly. Um, already corresponds to Roman expansion into Magna Graecia. Um, Pyrrhus enters, and that I believe the first battle of the war is um, the Battle of Heraclea. And yes. I think this is the the origin of the word Pyrrhic victory. You know, to anyone who does anyone who doesn't know, um, a Pyrrhic victory is essentially when you have won a victory, but it's essentially a defeat in in all, in all real sense. You haven't really gained any strategic advantage from it and your force your own losses are so extreme that again it negates any value from the victory a, a victory so gravely costly yes <laughs> more so more quickly summarize than my my rambling definition then <laughs> all good so yes um and um the Pyrrhus again defeats the Romans at the um, the Battle of Asculum, but and again with high casualties. And interestingly, well, uh, Asculum comes comes after because I believe um, in the intervening year, um, because he had, he took such losses, Pyrrhus goes to Tarentum and he basically tries to sort of um, um, put on a position of strength and demand concessions from the Romans in a treaty, which they mm. refuse. And so then he comes back with the army and then um, he has another um, so-called victory at Ausculum. And then um, after this, yeah, it, it's it's pretty much over and he has um, he has other commitments to attend to, I suppose. Something, 
Oh, I was just going to say this because you just mentioned Ascalon. That is an interesting uh, a, a series of events occurs between uh, Heraclea and uh, Ascalon, in that uh, he sends envoys to Rome when he goes back to Tarentum, and his envoy actually witnesses the Roman military machine at work, and reports back to Pyrrhus that the Roman military machine is frightening in its capability and the rapidity, uh, sorry, the speed in which the Romans actually recover their losses and rebuild their army is causes considerable alarm in Pyrrhus's camp. Yes, and um, this again is something we would see over and over again. It's something we again see in the Punic in the Second Punic War, is how Rome can I'd say, for example, in the Battle of Cannae. They can lose an army of 80,000 men, and yet they're ultimately able to win the war. I mean, it's incredible. Rome's determination to fight and ability to continually raise these arm armies really is astonishing. Um, you mentioned Columba, you know, um, commitments. Um, well, his original, again, attempt to um, defeat the Romans is, uh, as we mentioned, is a Pyrrhic victory. It is the origin of the term. And... Um, drawn by the promise of you know riches he is, is very much enticed to go and um, conquer Sicily and just to give you a bit of context as from our last stream of course Sicily had a um, variety of Greek colonies there were also Carthaginian colonies on the west coast around um, Lydibaeum and I believe the casus belli for Pyrrhus going into Sicily um, was the fact that he had some claim to the throne of Syracuse is that right? Um, yeah, I think there, there. Well, there have been a lot of um, um, contestations around Syracuse because there had been um, um, multiple leaders. You had, I think, um, Agathocles and and Hiero as well. So I, I think it was always sort of um, um, being passed around, and it was a sort of bone of contention. Although I'm, I'm not, I'm not an absolute expert. I couldn't tell you. Um, Pyrrhus, Pyrrhus marries, I think, Agath Agathocles' daughter. Um, oh, see, there we go. Yeah, and, and it's actually uh, when she eventually defects because she's a, uh, she finds Pyrrhus rather grotesque in his number of wives that he she actually defects the island of Corfu over to um, to the Antigonids in Macedon. Well, Marcus, would you like to um, give us just a quick overview of the Sicilian campaign? Oh, sure. So. Um, Whilst in Tarentum, so this is after Ascalon, so you could sort of call this the uh, the intermission between the two first battles and the final battle of the of the Pyrrhic War with Rome. Uh, he Pyrrhus has presented two offers: one, which is to um, to assume the throne of Macedon, which he eventually declines. Um, it, and in this, it, and whilst he's in Sicily, actually, the uh, it's the Antigone who comes to power in the vacuum of Macedon, um, and uh, and. Uh, Pyrrhus elects to go to Sicily and through his claim uh, on Syracuse eventually lands there. He's declared the essentially a despot by um, by the uh, the citizens of Tal Tal Talmina or Talmenion as was back then and Leonti and a number of other cities on the east coast. He manages to rapidly advance across the majority of uh, Sicily. He actually captures um, much of the north coast. He captures a uh, a Panormus, which is one day Palermo, in a pretty rapid siege, he breaks the walls, and it's actually in these sieges in northern Sicily he's famed for his leadership, where accounts both of his own on the Greek side and the Carthaginians attest to his uh, his courage, where he's essentially on the ladders climbing the walls, uh, killing enemies on the battlements. Um, uh, he takes a number of cities by uh, not by siege in terms of they surrender. So I think Selinius and uh, the Sicilian Heraclea surrendered to him peace, peaceably, but once he gets to the eastern edge of the, uh, sorry, the western edge of the island, where he comes against Lilibaeum and the old city of Motia, um, he has to. He's essentially compelled to raise taxes on his Sicilian subjects, and this is where Sicilian op opinion starts to turn against Pyrrhus. So after the failure of being able to, uh, him failing to capture Lilibaeum, he more or less leaves the island to his fate. Um, he ventures back to Sicily with the peer, uh, with the Epirate part of his fleet, and it's actually on the way back to uh, to Tarentum he uh, he uh, he uh, comes across a temple to Poseidon. I think it's to Poseidon, if I'm not mistaken, or Pese uh, Poseidon. Uh, on that map that you can see, it's the city of Locri, 
And as after he loads the gold from this temple um, onto his ships, so that there's a storm in the Mediterranean which sinks the majority of his fleet and the gold from the um, from the temple. And it's from this event onwards where he sort of considers himself somewhat cursed. Um, he ventures back to Tarentum, and we set the stage for the final battle with the Romans. If it's possible, because I thank you again for that um, elucidation, I would like to focus really on again the disaster that was the the Sicilian campaign. Because I think. Um, uh, Pyrrhus is quite an interesting figure. You mentioned the fact that he was fighting in the fray, that he was fighting on the battlements. Um, again, I, I think he very much drew himself um, in, in comparison to Alexander the Great and many sort of Hellenic monarchs at the time were following this example set by Alexander and fighting on the front lines as opposed to the Roman generals again. I think he would, was um, also um, he was also distantly related to Alexander, I think. Yes, I, I think so as well. Um, and, and again, I think it's also important to note it wasn't just um, Pyrrhus of Epirus. I also believe he had um, Ptolemaic support as well. And, you know, again, this is an extension of the, the War of the Diadochi when, you know, back on the um, in the Greek world, we have this ongoing feud between the Antigonids, the Ptolemies, and, um, and the Seleucids. But one thing I really want to sort of press um, Marcus is why he felt he was in a position where he had to abandon Sicily. Why did relations with the locals sour so much? And, you know, why was he considered a tyrant? Um, from what I do know, it was mainly the excessive taxation. I mean, he, he sailed to Sicily from Tarentum as a liberator or would-be liberator. And despite the valor that he did show him battle, um, he was unable to capture Lilibaeum. And to my understanding, I just don't think his Sicilian subjects were willing to endure years of campaigning. And I guess it's hard to get into the mind of his subjects or how they felt about him. But mm. was there also a sort of, um, sorry, was there a sort of ethnic idea here? Because um, um, was Lilibaeum also a Greek colony? Because there were lots of Phoenician colonies, especially in no, the West of so, Sicily, right? So Lilibaeum was Punic. If you draw a line on that map there that AM's pulled up, you got Panormus, which is sort of Palermo, and Lilibaeum, which is one day, I think, Masala in Sicily. If you sort of draw a line just west of those two cities, that is essentially the Punic part of the of the island. And those cities that lay within that sort of marker, you would consider Punic. So uh, Eryx, modern-day Eritrea, um is in there i think i think the guest is in there as well there's mm. a bunch of cities in there which were founded as punic cities by the original phoenician colonists and so perhaps they wouldn't view this as a, as a liberation of you know from, from one of their brothers you know because yeah they're, certainly, not, they're not greeks right certainly not and the easiest of the cities that I, he captured were panormus and uh erix Ericia. um but after that the the remaining cities proved to be a rather harder nut to crack and uh, as always was the case with Pyrrhus, he was usually short of short of money, and he was, in part, a brilliant tactician, but sometimes had strategic um, misgivings or very very much shortcomings. I think again, short, that's another fr yeah. another frustrating thing about it, Pyrrhus is that um, it's very much a the theme of his life. <laughs> mm. It was the same again with the throne of Macedon. I believe there were many chances where he could have um, expanded into Greece. You know, when we have um, you know Ptolemy Caranus and. Um, Lysimachus, and um, this is, you know, all, all sort of rather frustrating when you see that he always manages to pick the wrong campaign, <laughs> and you know, yeah, despite yeah. some um, temporary military victories, I think one point in terms of tyranny, you mentioned taxes. Um, as far as I believe, um, the original conception of the campaign, the advice given was um, from uh, two of his generals, um, Sosistratus and uh, Theonon. And um, I believe that um, he became increasingly paranoid as the Greek cities began to turn on him. And he eventually accused both of those men of tyranny, um, uh, sorry, of um, betrayal, uh, treason, and was able to execute um, Theonon and try to arrest Sosistratus, who managed to escape. So, um, again, kind of as we see with um, what happened to Parmenion uh, with Alexander the Great, I think um, there's also this, um, this element of paranoia. And I think exactly. part of that, um, perhaps we could put down to, um, of course, we, we've talked about um, how um, kingship has become so much more important in this period and the kind of um, 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 sense of sense of, um, um, you know, city state politics had sort of faded away. Um, perhaps that that's one of the reasons why we get these sort of um, um, treasons and betrayals is because things are much more individualistic. There's not mm. this idea of you're betraying the state. There's this idea of, well, if I take him out, I can be king as well, you know. And, 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 of, course, and of course, we could argue that um, Rome, 
Rome um, comes into this situation later. Uh, that buttresses onto a really interesting point. If we consider where the Greek polities in mainland Greece exist now in, in the post-Alexander world, uh, they're mostly uh, uh, you, there's still the Aetol, uh, Achaean League and the Aetolian League. We still have Sparta. There's still Athens in its diminished post-Peloponnesian War state. But the vast of the rest of the Greek world is made up of kingdoms. You have the Antigonids, or what would be the Antigonids of Macedon. You have the Seleucids and the Ptolemies in Egypt. You have Lysimachus and his family in Thrace. But the, the cities founded in Sicily were founded by the city-states that predate Alexander, predate the Persian Wars. And these cities, which either had little republics or little oligarchies or in some instances despots in the case of Agathocles with Sicily, they're not used to being ruled by a king. And the idea of kingship, I wouldn't say is entirely foreign to them, but it's something they are simply not used to. And when push comes to shove, when Pyrrhus is attempting to garner the funds and the resources to finish the campaign, so on this basis with the Sicilian campaign, I actually want to give him a bit of leeway because I think his subjects did chafe under him to some extent. There's this collapse of the relationship between the Sicilian subjects and Pyrrhus. And I think that basis of these Sicilian cities, the Sicilian colonies, uh, the, sorry, the Greek colonies in Sicily, having a different mindset to governorship and to kingship presents itself in the collapse of the campaign. Yeah, I mean, and, and one could understand that. I mean, sort of just based on the geographic situation of Sicily, you know, I mean, all of the all of the huge um, Greek kingdoms that are exercising such sway on the, you know, the Greek states and the Greek mainland are are in the east, and so Sicily is sort of out of the way and 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 yeah, sort of shielded from these from these developments. Yes, and I think um, we have to also mention that the reason again why the situation was different in Greece is that you had 20 to 30 years of the strategic and diplomatic brilliance of um, Philip II of Macedon, who was able to bring these this um, massive Greek coalition again ostensibly to fight a foreign enemy. Whereas Pyrrhus, you can say, was you know a, a complete failure in that regard. Ironically, um, he was able to always sort of incur more and more enemies. So we have one of the rarest examples of the Carthaginians and the Romans actually fighting alongside each other in this war in the face of a common threat, i.e. Pyrrhus. <laughs> Can't catch a break, can he? <laughs> so, so again, that's a, a testament to his um, he, diplomatic he really incompetence. Was good. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah so yes um this will this um takes us back um to the the prelude of the battle of um beneventum um you know you've already mentioned how um he abandoned sicily um however i think it's also important to note that i, I believe the um the samnites were also um rebelling at the same time so um yeah that yeah. there was there was basically this pretext that you know go back and maybe i'll capitalize briefly of this um this um roman um instability and yet he comes back and um manius curius donatus defeats pyrrhus the battle of beneventum you know causing him finally to abandon italy and um flee to epirus yeah was i'm pretty sure the romans were also engaged in some conflicts up in the north right with the with yes the Gauls as, you can see, as you can see with this map um we have you know etruria still hasn't been conquered and um you know the Gauls are just are just above the etrurians as well so um yes you know the, the Rome was still fighting on all sides it's um yeah, and, and um the Gauls remember for her viewers the Gauls are in the Po Valley at this point right you know so so they're they're over the Alps you know they're in Cisalpine and um and Gaul and in Italy you know in the case of the Sonona is even further south or the or the boy on that map I mean they're south of the Po um in areas yes uh, exactly. one thing one thing to consider as well is obviously the the Roman Republic have just ha, have just absorbed the Samnites in in prior to Pyrrhus coming to Italy. So the Samnites do rebel, but at the same time the Samnites are extremely distrusting because they feel alongside the uh, the other Italians who did uh, or the Italic peoples who did flock to Pyrrhus prior to the first two battles, they do feel abandoned by him. So the relationship between Pyrrhus and the Italic um, non-roman entities are at best tenuous and again this is something that you can extend to virtually all of his relationships with all of his um subordinated peoples at this point i mean again in true sort of um pyrrhus fashion he goes back to um to greece after this abandoning his allies you know having bankrupted himself having destroyed armies you know, he was the first one to bring elephants over to italy and of course um 
wasn't able to um he again they were quite effective at the battle of um Heraclea and Asculum, but nevertheless the Romans still won. He comes back to Greece. He tries to subjugate the Spartans. And I believe he is killed in the streets of Sparta when a woman throws a rock at him as he's trying to murder her son in the streets or something like that. I'm, I'm not I'm not sure it's Sparta, but it's Argos. I think it's Argos, Argos. yeah. And he's, and he's killed yeah. and he's but he is killed in a in a street battle, yeah. The yes. the greatest arguably one of the greatest warriors of the Hellenic world killed by a house brick. <laughs> <laughs> How, uh, and and this also Star corresponds Rick. to um as you mentioned you know Pyrrhus has already left um the Romans would go on to finally conquer Tarentum um and and again that brief Carthaginian sort of um cooperation with the Romans is uh, again completely reversed when Pyrrhus leaves because the Carthaginians aid Tarentum against the Romans um even though again it fails it stop fails to stop them from capturing the city and at this point, you know, the Romans uh, conquered that region, the, 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 the heel of the foot, which is um, Salento, also capturing Brindisium. And then they also attacked Calabria at the same time, um, raising the city of Regium as well. So um, really, as a result of, you know, Pyrrhus's failed incursion and his absence, we do have the, um, the complete subjugation of Magna Graecia. And as yeah. we know, during the um, First Punic War, which we won't really get into, the Romans also extend their influence, you know, across into Sicily as well. Yeah, the, I, I mean, I mean, that's like that's the on, that, sorry. sorry. I, I was just um, that that's like the main um the main result in terms of um the, the, the subject of our stream today um of the Pyrrhic Wars is is Rome becomes a player in this in in um in the Greek East in this in the in the um the competitions between the successor states Ptolemaic Egypt the Antigonids um Rome becomes a player and starts to um interact um more and more after the um defeat of Paris and, and the conquest of of the Greek cities of the of the south of Italy well yes Rome becomes you, you can almost say one of the principal Mediterranean powers because this is a defining moment in the original unification of Italy as well and um and again this brings them onto the conflict the main maritime power at the same time so uh, yeah. Moving on from this, oh, uh, sorry, oh, yes, uh, yes, Mark. Kept off. No, I was just yeah. going to say this is also the first instance where the Romans incorporate non-Roman peoples into the into the Republic. Um, the maps obviously just flipped over, but if you if you look at that map, the the Samnites, the Umbrians, um, those people are very closely related to Romans. They're sort of still Italic peoples with slight variations. There, the Roman venture into the south is the first instance. With the exception of the annexation of cities such as Kumai, as Neapolis on the coast, but in terms of annexing actual regions, the Italian conquest of what we have been referring to as Magna Greca in the last couple of streams is the first Roman absorption of non-Italian peoples into the Republic. Absolutely, and um, so moving on from um, the the again this original um, interaction. As you can see on this map, this is just before the first Macedonian Wars. The Romans have already established a presence on the eastern side of the Adriatic. And this is the um, the first of the Illyrian Wars, which um, you know, again gives the, the Romans a, a pretext for expansion. Um, as far as I'm aware, it is King Argon, got Argon of the um, um, RDA, who um, establishes the um, Illyrians as a significant military and a significant naval power, also expanding into northern Epirus, you know, again, resulting from the complete fallout of the, the collapse of um, Pyrrhus. And um, after he dies in 231, it is um, his regent, Queen Tuta, um, who begins uh, basically overseeing this massive expansion of piracy in the Adriatic, again, directed towards um, Magna Graecia and various Roman ships. And in addition to that, to make things worse, I also believe she's responsible for the um, massacre of Roman envoys as well to try and um, stymie the increase in piracy. And um, this, you know, begins the, the Roman incursion and the, the Roman attempt to try and establish a presence in, um, you know, areas such as um, cities such as Apollonia, um, modern day Albania. You know, first was there not they... also was there not also um um was it Philip V who had been I think he had allied with the Carthaginians in the yes, Punic War? Yes, slightly, slightly later. Um, this is just like the context before we get to the the first Macedonian War, and um and the Punic War. The Punic War, of course, is in two eighteen, and this is two two nine. Um, and uh, again, we have the creation of a puppet king in the form of um. Uh, Demetrius of Pharos, who is set up to oppose Tutus, 
but he again, you know, um, consolidates the fleet and again attacks the Romans whilst the Romans are engaged against, um, as you mentioned, Marcus, the um, the Gauls in um, the Alpine Gaul, just north of, just around the Po Valley. And as we can see in this map as well, the Romans have also expanded, you know, further north into Italy. Um, but again, this is this results in a complete failure. Um, the Romans defeat Demetrius, and um, they're able. And again, I think the significance of this conflict is that it really represents a Roman desire to eliminate a potential enemy as they're gearing up to fight the um, the Second Punic War, which will begin in 218. And, and again, you can say the the origin of that war very much is um, fabricated by the um, the Roman legions to, I believe, it's Saguntum, um, which gives them the official casus belli to prevent the, as you can see in this map, the Carthaginians have been expanding into um, Spain to offset the fact they also lost control of their influence over Sardinia and Corsica. And yes, Sar Sardinia. Sardinia and Corsica actually became um, effectively the first Roman provinces after the, the First Punic War. Um, you had the, the Centuriate Assembly or the Centuriate Assembly in Rome, and for the first time they elected... Um, 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 a, an extra number of praetors to go and administrate these these provinces, and and that's actually um, um pro a province wasn't even um, um an established concept at this time. It wasn't you know a, a discrete area of territory. Um, um, province comes from a pro winkia, which is sort of you know a pro sort of forward to yeah. and and winkia is is to bind or control, and so there's this idea of um pro winkia is 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 a power which is given to a general to go and wrap up affairs somewhere and sort of um yeah yeah sort of um consolidate gains. It wasn't actually the idea you have provinces yet but this is um the the beginning of that of course incredibly important yes and of and, course we uh, sorry marcus no, i was just going to say uh, this is a fine example of uh, the roman knack for diplomacy and also double dealing in that diplomacy um if you look on that map there where uh, the carthaginian holding in iberia uh just where the word is iberian it, the border of the carthaginian territory follows a river called the Elbro. Yeah, and the Romans more or less form an ins uh, when they do the treaty with uh, the Carthaginians following the First Punic War. Basically, the Elbe is considered the the delineation line between their sphere of influence and the Roman sphere of influence. Yeah. However, as you mentioned, the Romans have an alliance with Saguntum, but Saguntum lies south of the Elbe, so there's the sticking point for the diplomacy. And this is a continuous thing you're going to see. You're going to see Rome intervening and forming various alliances and. Um, this is sort of the frustration thing as a sort of as any sort of Greek nationalist would look at this and say, you know, well, no, the, the Greeks really destroyed themselves so much as the Romans were able to enter into a situation and capitalize on that. The ability to Rome or Rome to um to ally with certain tribes and again use that as a pretext is going to be a constant. Um as again with the Greeks attempting to, you know, create a monarch to oversee various, you know, leagues and various cities, and that also, you know, failing and crashing down as it happened with Pyrrhus. Um, but again, you can't really ignore the Punic Wars when it comes to how it pertains to reactions with Greeks, because uh, as we're going to mention, there are quite a lot of illusions. So, um, of course, Hannibal, you know, crosses the Alps and invades Italy. And he wins a very famous victory, which I've already mentioned, which is Cannae in 216, where he defeats 80,000 Romans with a force of um, 40,000 Carthaginians. And it is from this point that um, we have the alliance between Philip V of Macedon in 214 with the Carthaginians. And as you can see in the map here, Syracuse, which we've alluded to, was, of course, independent during this time. And in, two, in 214, the same year, Syracuse would ally with the Carthaginians as well, as would many of the Italic city-states um, with the Carthaginians. And of course, you know, one of the principal reasons, again, apocryphal reasons as to why uh, Hannibal didn't win the war was because he expected a treaty be, to be signed after Cannae and he didn't push the advantage and um, march on Rome. Um, I'm sure you might have other reasons as to why the, um, the Carthaginians lost in that ensuing phase, but nevertheless, um, the Greek states began turning against the, the Roman Republic at this point. And Syracuse is an interesting example because they turn against the Romans. And the Romans, under um, Consul Marcus Marcellus, um, besieged the city. And um, I, I believe Archimedes is there also trying to devise, you know, various anti-siege um, traps. I believe, well. um, so, so the story goes, he developed a sort of 
array of um bronze mirrors that had been shone until they um that had been that had been um cleaned until they they shone very brightly and um you know had them arrayed so that they would concentrate the light into a into a beam you know yes. and then, and then this beam was supposedly aimed at the sails of the roman ships mm. um, um which is a wonderful story i really hope it's true you know um, I mean, there are lots of sort of famous moments from that as well. Obviously, the, the Romans take the city and they go and execute Archimedes. And I believe the word, one of the last words he, um, he mentioned was, um, don't disturb my circles, of course, referring to... Um, uh, again, it's just um, sad, the, the conquest of Syracuse and the, and the destruction of um, that ancient Greek city. And as we can see, you know, the further almost extension of that consolidation of, um, of Magna Graecia, resulting in the, the final conquest of Cis, um, Sicily, because um, Syracuse would be left out of it. But in terms of how this impacts the rest of the Greek world and Macedon in particular, um, it doesn't really. The Aetolian League, as, as you previously mentioned, um, Marcus, um, and, and just to give you a bit of reference, you know, what the Aetolian League is, um, it represents essentially core central Greece, you know, south of Epirus, but um, west of um, Boetia and um, Attica, north of um, Achaea and south of Thessaly. And, now, um, wait, did, did the Aetolian League include um, the north of the Peloponnese, or, or, or I'm pretty sure it included a large part of the Peloponnese as well, didn't it? No, that's Mark. the Achaean League. No, it w w I'm not even on the north coast. I must I be don't, mistaken. Not, I don't think so. No. No. Okay. no the Aetolian League was uh, it, where you see the Gulf of Corinth. The that was the separation point between the two leagues. Sure. Yeah. 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 Okay. I, I must. Have, I must have misread that. <laughs> you know, it's been it's been a confusing read sometimes. It, 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 is over all this stuff again. it is Greek diplomacy. So honestly, who knows, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Carry on, gentlemen. Yes. But um, anyway, yes. This is headquartered the Greek city of Thermon, and they this again represents the beginning of um, the Romans pitting various allies against other Greek allies. In this case, it's the Aetolian League against Philip V of Macedon. Um, however, most of the fighting is basically relegated towards skirmishes and um, naval battles because as as the Romans are prosecuting the um, the Punic War, the Second Punic War. Um, their essential strategy is just to keep the Macedonians occupied and prevent them from acting, you know, aggressively against Rome, um, because they simply did not have the resources at that time to be able to fight a war of expansion at towards Macedon. At, I would say, just as an addendum to that, I would say the reason. The reason the reason why they were able to do that is because um, at, at at this time at the time of the Second Punic War the Romans unusually um, had the naval advantage right, mm. but by quite a large degree they had they had hundreds of ships and the Carthaginian fleet had been um um severely restricted after the after the um the treaty that be, that had been signed after the First Punic War so so the Romans were able to um to to dominate the seas and to um stop any forces crossing the Adriatic or or um or the straits between um Africa or Sicily in a way that was more effective than they than they might have before this is also why um Hannibal was never resupplied or at least that's the um that's the prevailing theory uh, well the other the other theory of Sorry, no, I was going to say certainly not resupplied properly because if you actually look at the uh, the details of the of the Second Punic War, the Carthaginians actually managed to successfully send reinforcements to Iberia. They send a force to land on Sardinia. They successfully reinforce Hannibal's brother Has Hasrubal, not the brother-in-law, yeah. the brother, who is defeated at the Battle of Matarus River up in the uh, north of Rome. They send reinforcements essentially everywhere except to Hannibal directly yes, because the and... Roman navy contain him along with the land forces, and but... that is a part of the mastery of the Roman strategy under under Quintus Fabius Maximus. Mm, who, who, who? Afterwards, um, that's where that's where the Fabian strategy comes from. The, after, the, after, the uh, after Hannibal. Yeah, Cunc Cunctator. He was given this um, Cunctator, sort of mocking yeah. name in Rome, which, which sort of means the delayer, or, or um, yeah, exactly, because, yeah. Because, because he advocated a, a, a scorched earth strategy, kind of you know, um, I suppose similar to the Russians in, in the war, where they would retreat and 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 um, and deny any resupply and just um, wear out their enemy whilst avoiding a direct engagement. It's funny you make that reference. I, I don't want to obviously get stalled here just for the sake of the people people listening. The Romans actually proportionally in the Second Punic War suffer greater casualties to men of military fighting age than what the Soviets do in the Second World War. And the Romans do it essentially without any help. And moreover, if I'm not mistaken, the statistics that I've come across more or less extrapolate that one in seven men of fighting age in the Roman Republic died throughout the course of the Second Punic War and they still won. 
Yeah, it's it's quite remarkable, you know. I mean, but you see this, you see this throughout. I mean, in, in the first Punic War as well, you know, the the Romans are getting trashed in the naval engagements, and so what do they do? Well, they capture a um, a Carthaginian ship, um, reverse engineer it, and build a hundred of them, and and then add a sort of um. A, a swiveling gangplank that they call a raven onto the front of each ship, which can um, then be let loose and slammed down onto a Carthaginian ship, pinning it and allowing the legionaries to get across. You know, it's, so it's just exactly. constant innovation, constant um, pushing of what is possible, and and one one can only sort of imagine the um the 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 the, the duty to the state that was felt amongst the people and the and the ideological sort of terror of the roman state you know i mean it, it, it's Correct. it's very similar to later total states but um it's, this is a digression i suppose exactly and i'll just finish on this note that we did touch on roman adaptability in to, to a, quite a profound degree in the gallic chat when we talked about gaul and again we see this theme whether it's the romans fighting the macedonians will obviously touch on that a bit later and the the triumph of the legion of the maniple over the phalanx but you mentioned about the carthaginian navy the romans discover a Carthaginian ship, reverse engineer it, build it, make improvements. And then the Romans realize that, oh, we're superior fighters and we're very good ground fighters. Let's make a naval battle a ground battle. <laughs> and that's where the Romans gain supremacy over the sea. It's it's just another example of this Roman mindset of being completely unashamed to adapt methods which are superior to their own and then to improve upon them. Yes. So, yes, and that, that um, from that wonderful little excursion to the Punic Wars that takes us back to Macedon, um, the Romans achieve their ultimate aim, as I mentioned, which is detaching Macedon from Carthage before the Punic War ends by arriving at peace with them in 205. However, within, as you can see in this map, we have the, um, the division between Macedon, the Ptolemaic Empire, and the Seleucid Empire as well. Um, this relatively stable situation where these empires had existed since the original wars of the Diadochi um, collapses when Ptolemy IV of Egypt dies and um, the Ptolemaic dynasty plunges into another civil war which is you know, something we're going to come back to in terms of a perennial problem for, for the Egyptians and this leads to a Seleucid Macedonian alliance aimed at the conquest of most of the um, Egyptian possessions, as you can also see on this map. If you look at a region such as Sicilia or a region such as um, Lycia in the south and various other cities, the Egyptians have holdings all across Anatolia as well. And so much of the war is directed at these holdings. And so um, Philip V um, directs his attacks at um, establishing his own domination over Thrace and the Dardanelles and um, he then begins to attack um, Samos and Miletus and just to give you like a bit of perspective um, Rhodes and Pergamon are both very alarmed at the, these new developments because they're effectively going to be completely surrounded on all sides by Hellenic superpowers and they're going to have very little room for maneuver so after you know fighting the um, Macedonians and fighting the Seleucids, they, you know, do something incredible, which is actually um, appeal to the Romans in 200 to intervene on their behalf. And um, in response, the Romans send Philip V an ultimatum to leave the city of Abydos. And this fails. Um, Philip V, you know, is, um, you know, the king of the Macedonians. He believes the Romans have essentially no influence or interest in this region. And so any sort of threat from them is just, you know, basically worthless. They're not going yeah, to Yeah, I mean, the Romans, the Romans are still, at least to some extent, sort of scorned as barbarians by the Greeks, you know, they're these sort of Western barbarians. They're, they're a power, but they're, they're, not, they're not Greeks, you know. Which I was going to say, there's a nice little reflection, uh, not, to, not to go on another tangent, but when, um, when uh, Pyrrhus first lands in southern Italy and they come across the Romans the first time at Heraclea, Pyrrhus says to his, um, his second in command, is it Megacles? I can't remember his, might be Megacles. And he, and he sort of re referenced the fact that he goes, oh, these Romans don't look my, much like barbarians to me. When he sets out on their camp, he just saw this perfect grid pattern and this wooden fort that was built in a, you know, an, an, um, an afternoon. So yes, um, go going back onto the, um, this is the second of the Macedonian Wars. Um, contrary to the expectation of Philip V, the Romans do decide to prosecute this war and it is prosecuted by um, Titus Flaminius, um, who I believe is one of the, the youngest consuls ever elected. I think he's uh, elected consul before the age of 30, which I, I think is even in breach of um, 
the Roman law pertaining to the the election to the consul that you have to be above thirty in order to be elected. Am I correct? Yes, that? yes, which gives you an idea of the sort of um, I suppose desperation of the situation. It was it was a, it was a very trying time for the republic. Nevertheless, I think. I was going to say, if I'm not mistaken, didn't a Roman have to be 30 but prior to entering the Senate? So for him to actually be consul before 30s... I know, it's, it's pretty incredible. Yeah, exactly. It's pretty incredible. Um, and again, Titus Flaminius is one of these um, very interesting characters because he's obviously um, a great general because he arrives in Thessaly. And um, you know, again, as you mentioned, Thessaly has um, been part of the Macedonian realm since the alliance between um, Philip II and the Thessalians and the, you know, the creation of the city of Thessaloniki. Um, but nevertheless, he's able to defeat Philip V at the battles of Aeosin 198 and um, uh, Sinocephaly in um, 197. And um, yeah, this is a complete shock. This is the first time the Romans have actually you know, invaded Greek, Greece proper or Hellas and Macedonia and um, dealt, you know, a relatively decisive victory with, you know, actual very little sort of exertion of effort. Yeah. And um, so the Roman terms are actually quite generous. Um, as a result of this, Philip surrendered his Greek gains, as I mentioned, mainly at the expense of um, uh, the Ptolemaic dynasty. And to even go from this, this is, a, again, an interesting uh, thing to consider regarding um, Greco-Roman relations, is that uh, Flaminius proclaims the freedom of the Greeks at the um, Isthmian Games in Corinth. And then goes further, you know, there is the, the brief sort of plundering of Sparta in 195 BC, but then, you know, Roman troops are removed in 194 BC. So it's, it's interesting how the Romans are in a position where they can establish a more permanent presence, but they actually do as much as possible to establish good relations with the Greeks. Yeah, this is, the this, is, um, this is interesting. It does kind of make sense because if I'm not mistaken, um, this this was not a novel move. In fact, if you look at the sort of um, you know, as we've said, nebulous contentions of the different um, um, Greek kingdoms, you know, the successor kingdoms, um, often they would do this. You know, if they if they um, captured a piece of territory or won a war, they would make a grand show of making a sort of declaration of freedom as a sort of um, you know, um, political move. I, and so I would say that the Romans doing this, this, does, this doesn't represent the sort of imposition of Roman Republican values. Rather, this represents um, the, f the further engagement of the Romans with um, 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 Greek politics and Greek strategy, you know, and, and again, demonstrating that they learn very quickly. And there's another interesting, sorry, Marcus, there's another interesting comparison again back onto the um, Peloponnesian War, is that the Achaean League, uh, and as we as we mentioned last time, um, Macedon had basically been the hegemon of um, Greece for almost 200 years, you know, for 100 years up until this point. And um, the Achaean League actually wanted Rome to go further. They wanted the complete and utter dismantling of Macedon. And the Romans refuse. They basically leave the situation basically status quo antebellum. And yeah. um, you know, this is incredible in the sense that they're not trying to, you know, raise one power or the other or necessarily appease the Greeks or oppose the Macedonians. And again, as you mentioned, Columba, they are interjecting on the basis of the, the Hellenic um, diplomacy of the Diadochi rather than imposing some form of, you know, Romanized administration. They will eventually do that, but for now they don't. And I have to question, you know, the the Roman wisdom in doing this. So I have two hypotheses um, hypotheses considering this because um, the Romans would very quickly prepare for war between um, 197 and 192 to face off on the much bigger threat, which is the Seleucid Empire. As I mentioned, in terms of the um, the origin of that war, um, one of the key factors wasn't just the um, expansion committed by Philip V; it was also the expansion committed by the Seleucids at the same time. So I think if the Romans weren't aware of this, it seems like an incredibly short-sighted strategy to pull out of um, pull out Roman interests of the region just at the same time that um, Antiochus III, you know, pictured here, um, was essentially expanding and very much um, almost to the point where he had reconquered most, if not all, of oh, um, yeah. Alexander's I mean, empire. I mean yeah i mean there are there are a couple of considerations to be made here because i mean i mean we, we we talked about this last time in our in our last stream gentlemen that the 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 three i mean you know it's complicated but it's very clear that the three main powers in in, in the in the um in the greek world are the macedonians um the egyptians under the ptolemies and the um the antigonids and there's this um um balance of powers if you will that is to some extent um based on previous um you know 
um, geopolitical developments and the development of um, discrete infrastructure and such like. And um, and so when Rome um, in the first Macedonian War, they already sort of disturbed the balance of power. But um, by coming in here, and you know, like like we've said, they don't they don't um, absolutely take over the the, um, the Macedonian kingdom, nor do they um, assign um, um, somebody with. Um, as I've said, Proinkia, you know, the, the power to go out um, um, and organize it. They don't do this. And so what ends up happening is, um, but they do um, restrict the Macedonians from um, engaging in activities outside of their territory in a treaty. Uh, and so this this ends up in a situation where um, at the exact time as Antiochus, who has just concluded a, a campaign against the Iranians and reclaimed a lot of territory there, um, you know, he's he's being proclaimed the great Antiochus, the great, um, a second Alexander, um, which is always a, a prompt concern. You know, you want to you want to portray yourself as the second Alexander. Um, the Romans have have taken out one of his prime rivals um, in the grand scheme of things. And so there's this, um, yeah, this massive power imbalance that the Romans soon have to come in and, and rectify. Well, this is why I consider the Roman strategy in more depth, because, I mean, it's even worse for the Romans if you if you take the view that um, uh, Flaminius was being naive and as a result, Roman foreign policy directed towards the Greek um, world was being naive. Because um, Antiochus had expanded, you know, towards India. He had, you know, re-annexed and reincorporated areas such as Bactria and Arachosia, and the empire was bordering India. And as a result, you know, Antiochus had, um, you know, these vast reserves of Indian war elephants as well. Um, you know, in addition to that, he'd also won a successful war against the Ptolemaic Empire as well, uh, taking over um, uh, Kohli Syria. And more than that, he was able to pacify the uh, Ptolemaic um, dynasty by 195, establishing peace with Egypt and marrying in to the Ptolemaic family by, you know, making his daughter the um, the queen of um, the queen of Egypt, which, you know, is actually going to play a quite interesting role later. Mm. So um, he had pacified, you know, all of his other rivals. He had pacified Egypt. Um, you know, potentially he could have inherited the Egyptian throne through his claim at some point had he decided to press it. And he'd already expanded um, to encompass Alexander's you know, former territories in the east. Um, you know, the only thing that was really left was the, um, the Greek world. And this is why I think the Romans were actually sort of preparing for this conflict, because one of the effects of the peace with Macedon is that Macedon became favorably predisposed towards the Romans. Um, because essentially the Romans could offer them territorial concessions and, you know, a, bre a break on their reparations, which the Seleucids could not. And ironically, the Romans would be the ones protecting the Macedonians against the encroachments of the Seleucids. Mm -hmm. And as you can see um, in this map as well, we originally had the um, Aetolians siding with the Romans against the Macedonians. Well, now, as a result of Antiochus, he comes in and brings the Aetolians against the Macedonians and against the Romans as well. But there's, you know, there's also, um, I, I believe, sort of civil war uh, going on as well. For example, the um, the Aetolians are trying to conquer the Achaean League, and they, um, I believe, they basically bring an end to the classical independence of the city of Sparta at the same time, one nine two. But again, in terms of the idea that I have that the Romans were actually preparing for this war, um, many of the garrisons, I believe, have been, you know, basically reorganized in the wake of the Second Macedonian War. Um, the garrisons, for example, in Hispania and um, southern Gaul, um, you know, which had just been conquered during the Second Punic Wars, were, you know, incredibly light, uh, whereas the garrisons in Sicily were being reinforced. So I believe the Romans were basically preparing for war and it was just a matter of um finding a pretext i mean that, 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 that is sorry mark it's after you i was just going to say something we have to consider here is we did kind of just brush past it that when you're talking about um flamidinus am he was renowned even in his day of being a helenophile and even though he did vanquish uh well rather he defeated um philippos at the battle of conicephalae he did treat them with a light hand. And even though one thing which did great the Macedonians is you see in this map here, the loss of Thessaly is something they never really got over because they really did consider it an integral part of the Macedonian kingdom. Um, I think when you look back even to the Roman treatment of the Illyrians initially in the Illyrian war and the Romans and their treatment of Philip, certainly in their first two treaties, contrary to how a lot of people view Rome in in the wider context of history of being this sort of ferocious, 
conquering pitiless empire the romans always had this respect for greek civilization and considered themselves either kin or inheritors of something which the greeks offered and when you look at the the initial interventions and the initial reluctance of rome to becoming twined and entangled in the Greek sphere and having treated them quite lightly early, I think that is a very transparent, a very clear indication of the fact that the Romans did not actually bear desires to conquer the Hellenic territories, certainly in the initial part of this, uh, of these wars. Mm. Sorry, Columbo, go ahead. I was just, I mean, there might be something to this, right? And I, and I get what, I, I might contend your your assertion, Marcus. I mean, I mean, there, there, there is certainly this Greekophile tendency in the third century, but um, there's there's a question about how far that extends back, right? Um, oh, no, I was um, referring specifically to Flaminanus when I said that. I wasn't sure, sure. To Rome broadly. But, but um, I, I suppose, I suppose the point that I would make is, um, um, if we look at the Punic Wars, for example, to go back, um, I mentioned that the first provinces um, or the first um, um, places where um, uh, men with provincia were sent out um, was Corsica, Sardinia. Um, now, 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 the circumstances in which they had been taken over um, after the first Punic War, um, these, the, 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 these islands were still in the possession of the Carthaginians, but the Carthaginians um, um, had basically gotten into a lot of debt um, hiring mercenaries in the first war. Um, and so the Numidians were bearing down on them, and the Romans, um, um, in violation of a treaty, um, basically um, piled on the Carthaginians and demanded um, um, that they pay an indemnity and that they hand over these islands. Um, and this this was pretty much the main cause of the the, the second war with Hannibal. But but I bring this up because. Um, um, there, there was this sense that and um, when Hannibal came in and then there were these great victories um, and, and Polybius comments on this in some sense um, um, the, the Romans um, perceived this as a result of um, their violation of a treaty and, and, and faithlessness you know and, and of course if we look at um, 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 Roman sort of republican virtues fides you know or, or faithfulness was one of the the, 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 the most important um, characteristics of a good Roman and so what do they do uh, and this brings back um, um, Marx, um, Marx's point about respect for Greek culture um, not only do they consult the Roman priests um, but they consult the Delphic oracle about what they should do um, and so and so then we have um, the bringing of the magna mater an eastern goddess and so there's this sort of idea of um, um, if we are going to take over um, Phoenician colonies, we must sort of um, 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 Phoenicianize ourselves and bring in this new goddess. So, so the, the, the Romans at this point, we must remember, this is not the 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 cynical culture of the the empire or the late republic. Oh, at this time, at this time, um, sorry. Doubtless, I agree with you there, hundred percent. Yeah, and at this point, there are still a very strong. Um, um, ideas of pietas, which would have a real, um, you know, piety uh, and and, and, re and correct religious observance, which have, um, you know, deep importance. I mean, at this point, we're still having, um, you know, I mean, if a vestal virgin, um, you know, who, who tends the sacred flame in Rome, if she sleeps with a man, she is taken to the forum, she's dragged to the forum and buried alive, you know? Mm -hmm. And so, so there's these ideas that all these rituals and, and, a, and a correct relationship with the god are vital to the maintenance of the state as a whole, you know? Um, um, and so um, that might be a reason why they didn't start a war because they didn't have a casus belli. But that, I mean, it doesn't stop them from preparing for a war, as you said. Yeah. I think I think the attitude, though, that I I mostly agree with what you said. I think because now we're touching on the Seleucid part of the conflict. I think this is where the attitude actually does fundamentally change. And one yes, thing I want to yes, through... things become far more cynical after this. That's totally true. Correct. Correct. And one thing I want to throw you AM's way, and this isn't a digression, I'm just saying this is a bit of, you know, rank punditry almost. Uh, the the proposed um, the proposed partition of the Ptolemaic territories and the Aegean by the Macedonians and the Seleucids is eerily ironic. And funnily enough, in a similar place of the world geographically, as to the partition uh, proposed of the Ottomans by the Austrian and Austrians and the Russians, you know, a millennia and a half later. Or two millennia later, there's an interesting kind of you know yeah, historical yeah. rhyming going on. And this is um, it's where I get sympathetic with these guys who make these arguments about you know these these sort of fundamental distinctions between like perhaps um, um Semitic or, or or populations and, and what what get called an Aryan or an Indo-European population. There might be these really deep 
allegiances and differences in the culture which um make things play out this way and things are divided this way but that 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 is certainly a a, a digression so i will i will return to am and let him let him hammer on with the chronology sure right um well again thank you for those points both of you um as i mentioned you know the war is basically started off by the aetolian league basically adopting a very sort of anti-roman posture towards the various other leagues and allies um roman allies in um in greece and antiochus uses this as a pretext to um land in greece after having already expanded into um to thrace and i believe he um he sets up um camp in euboea and tries to bring you know the athenians and the um, boetian league on his side but as you can see in this map there was a lot of gray so a lot of people did not join the seleucids in you know what he very much wanted to identify as a anti-roman revolt and as a result um we, he only really had the serious alliance in the form of the um the Etodian league um the the romans invade and he um establishes his military presence at the same site at thermopylae as we mentioned in the previous stream the famous battle of thermopylae against um, the greeks and the persians in 480 and in the same way he's defeated by the roman consul Calabrio in um 191 and euboea is um quickly um taken back afterwards. The interesting thing is that um, Euboea actually treats the Romans as the liberators and the so-called liberator Antiochus the Great as the conqueror. So again, it sort of shows how this um, diplomatic tact of trying to, uh, almost eerily similar to Pyrrhus, of this king trying to establish himself as the protector of the various Greek settlements actually in fact goes down very badly. And, um, I think um, this this might also, in some sense, um, go towards answering your question on why the Romans were so lenient. Because again, they can they can claim this liberator status against the you know this eastern tyrant, basically. Yes, and um, he, of course he moves back to um, Ephesus, and um, this is also where you uh, you mentioned earlier, Columba, about um, Roman naval supremacy. Um, now it's a matter of controlling the Aegean because it protects Anatolia, but it also is Antiochus's way of, you know, re-establishing any invasion force. And um, the Romans are able to defeat the Seleucids at um, Coicus. Uh, probably uh, another little interesting thing to note, in addition to the fact the, um, the Ptolemaic dynasty had um, signed peace with Antiochus, is that Antiochus had actually um, been receiving advice from Hannibal. Um, Hannibal, of course, had lost yes, the yes, of, he had. I forgot yes. about that. Um, Hannibal, of course, had lost the Battle of Zama um, against Scipio Africans. Scipio Africans, who coincidentally was also one of the leading war hawks against the Seleucids at the same time. Um, so a lot of, you know, very sort of interesting coincidences and parallels between this. Um, Hannibal goes over this and he's put in charge of the um, of a Seleucid navy, uh, which the Rhodesians, again, uh, rekindling their alliance from the Second Macedonian War, and the Romans defeat Hannibal at uh, Eurymedon. And the Seleucid fleet is again defeated at the, um, the Battle of Myonesus. So as you mentioned before, Columba, it is just this reconfirmation of um, the, the Romans being able to take control of the sea. And as a result, um, all sort of pretensions of taking over Greece, you know, have completely fallen. And Antiochus adopts a far more aggressive strategy towards Pergamon. Um, nevertheless, you know, the Romans invade Anatolia for the first time, and they are able to gain this incredible victory at the um, Battle of Magnesia. Um, in terms of the numbers for this battle, it's one of the largest battles, you know, during this this entire period mm -hmm. of warfare. Um, Livy, who was one of the, you know, great, you mentioned um, Polybius, um, uh, Livy is also one of the great chroniclers of this time, um, contends that the Seleucids had twice as many troops as the Romans and lost something like 53,000 men. Mm -hmm. But I believe it's more or less assumed nowadays that both sides had equal numbers and that the Seleucid casualties would be much less. I, I, I think I think I think most people that I've read anyway, um, they, they argue that the Seleucids had an advantage in numbers, but it wasn't as, it wasn't as wild as the sources advantage. say. Yeah. yeah. The the ancient sources that I would suggest have portrayed Magnesia to be rather more one side than what it was. But needless to say, if you look at an analysis of the battle, what more or less happens is each army manages to collapse the opposite army's left wing. And it just so happens that the Romans are able to collapse the Seleucid left and roll up the centre, whereas the Romans lose their left flank, but they manage to stay in cohesion. Hence and I would why add... the Seleucids lose more in the battle. 
all and I would add that the um the same thing um essentially happens during the battle of um of Kinoskephali earlier um because because yes. what we see um and I'm pretty sure that um um Antiochus he had a lot of sort of eastern troops who were sort of you know in the tradition of eastern rulers going back to the Persians um were you know um sort of lightly armored not very useful but he did have um and phalanxes as well did he not Correct. Well, yes. yeah. Well, it's one but, of the but this is, but where the Romans come into contact. Because one thing I actually did want to talk about, um, we just sadly skipped through, and I didn't get a chance to mention it. What you do have, largely over the course of these wars, from Pyrrhus to sort of the the Battle of Magnesia, is a gen is a gradual and general degradation of the quality of the phalanx. It yeah. is not of the strength of Alexander's. The phalanx doesn't have the support troops that, that Alexander's phalanx had. It doesn't have the 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 lighter troops. Doesn't have the more hoplite armed units. It's basically a case of these big unwieldy phalanxes, peltasts, and cavalry. It becomes a far less complex army. And for the first time, the Romans when they uh, deploy against Antiochus at Magnesia, the Romans are confronted for the first time against proper heavy cavalry in the form of the cataphracts, which um, Antiochus brings to the battle. Yeah, he's also they along fighting alongside the the Seleucid phalanx is Galatian swordsmen who were famed for their for their valor and for their fighting quality. And the phalanx, do, uh, sorry, the, the the swordsmen do make up for the deficiencies of the phalanx. And despite these two things, which the Ro Romans are confronted with. At the first, for the first time at Magnesia, they still triumph. Yeah, I think I think there are there are a couple of things here. There, there is certainly a decline in the in the quality um, um, of of the um, Antigonid forces relative to Alexander's. But I must say that um, um, the decline doesn't account for this pattern that we see. And so at Kinoscephali, um, um, I believe it's um, yeah, F Philip's right. Um, manages Phil, Philip's right wing manages to advance again, um, um, but it advances too far with the phalanx. And well, and it, almost, the, and, it almost almost breaks Flaminus actually. Like the Romans hold but, but on for dear life. But then yes, but then the Romans manage to come in um, and cut through the middle of the line and come round yeah. the side of the phalanx, and we see a similar situation. Well, in well, Nic well Nic Nicanor on the opposite flank wasn't organized, and the problem with the phalanx is if a fa phalanx isn't appropriately deployed and at the ready well this is the point i'm trying to make yes is, Sorry, is, that, is, that, is that the phalanx <laughs> is that the phalanx is is nowhere near as 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 agile or as mobile i mean a phalanx for those people who don't know is is as you know a lot of men with sarissas these very long pikes um and they march forward you know um but but, but the problem of course is they're very difficult to turn and and the romans um who were just as organized as the Macedonian army, just as well drilled. Um, um, you know, the Macedonians had often fought against Eastern forces, Persians who were far less well drilled, but the Romans essentially had the same level of training, but also had a, a manipular system in the legions, uh, an organizational system, um, and, and used short swords and javelins, um, which allowed them to um, outmaneuver, outmaneuver, yeah, outmaneuver the phalanx. And we see this, yeah. we see this time and time again. And so the Romans are um, are 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 just as well drilled, have just as efficient a state, but their their tactics and their equipment are one step ahead, and they will be for for many centuries. Yeah, so just for the chat, just for those who aren't exactly aware, the the Greek forces at this time, from Alexander onwards, the, or rather from Philip II onwards, basically fight with the, anywhere from a 19 to a 24 foot pike, which has to be held with two arms. And so they have tiny shields, and in order to not be laden, they're not given the heaviest of armor, it's actually quite light armor. And inversely facing them are Romans who wear the scutum, who wear iron uh, or bronze or iron helmets they have the short short uh, short swords they're clad in uh, chain mail armor they're a far more adaptable infantrymen than what the greek unit is yes and um sort of moving on from that and again thank you both for that um introduction to um roman vis-a-vis -vis greek warfare um there is also something else i want to mention obviously um another sort of illusion we've already mentioned the Scipio Africans of course it is Scipio Asiaticus who um defeats um Antiochus III in addition to the exiled um Eumenes II of Pergamon um in the Treaty of um Apamia you know the Seleucids 
again, they lose a lot of territory. So as you can see on this map, we have um, a lot of red, and again, that is the Seleucid presence in Anatolia. With the exception of um, Lycia in the south, you know, bordering on the um, the island of Rhodes, actually all of this um, territory goes to Pergamon. And the new border vis-a-vis um, -vis the Roman allies, because of course Pergamon and Rhodes are basically Roman allies, then become Roman client states. Um, will be established at the Taurus Mountains, you know, at the, the borders of Cappadocia. Um, one of the th things that is very interesting is that, as we mentioned, Antiochus was able to rely on this vast manpower pool and variety of soldiers from basically all of the former possessions of Alexander the Great's empire, with the exception of Egypt, which had formed a peace treaty with Antiochus. And yet he was more than willing to give a very sort of disadvantageous peace to the Romans when Again, he had so much more in the um, in the means of manpower, and as you mentioned, the, the the Roman willingness to win the Second Punic War, where they were losing, you know, one in seven of um, men of fighting age. Um, I, I do think it's incredible comparing the me the mentality of the um, the Seleucid royal dynasty versus that of the Roman Republic in terms of a willingness to win, but not only a willingness to win, but a willingness to win completely. A part of that, I think, is reflective, too, of the fact that we have two very different nations, never mind in terms of psychology or even a contrast between the Greek mindset and the, the sort of Helleno-Greek mindset and the, the Latin-Italic mindset, which do have distinctions within them. But the other thing, too, is if we take into exception the provinces which the Romans had recently acquired in this previous century, we're talking... Sicily, we're talking Corsica and Sardinia, uh, Roman, the Romans having ventured into southern Gaul and annexed portions of Illyria. The the if you if to use a phrase, if the guts of Italy is still genuinely Latin, and the sources, whether you read Livy, whether you read Polybius, uh, the all the ancient authors emphasize quite dramatically the the almost limitless manpower of Italy. So take into account that the a large majority of the Roman population of the Republic is Italic, Italic and Latin, and you sort of have this uniformity long, long prior to sort of our modern conceptions of nations. What the Romans have is this sort of this eth this uh, this unity of ethnos, right? Particularly yes. in terms of government and and the state, right? Comparatively, and obviously much more so with the Seleucos and the Seleucid realm than even say with Macedon, you have these. It is a large and a strong and a powerful and a wealthy empire. But you mentioned also that Antiochus had just reintegrated uh, the eastern provinces and had pushed the the border back to the Indus River, or, you know, to, towards the Indian nation or the Indian kingdom. Uh, earlier in his reign, he had pacified Egypt uh, after the Battle of Raphia, and he had conquered parts of Syria. But nonetheless, you still have this massively diverse, very disparate, a physically large empire with a lot of different peoples, probably suffering from a similar problem that the the old Achaemenid Persian Empire had of when you have sort of too much diversity, too much differentiation between peoples, and you've got this elite, which is not the majority, and certainly in the Greek case, less so than in the Persian instance previously yeah. with the Achaemenids, you're trying to hold this sort of externally it's strong or it looks strong superficially but underneath it's far more fractured it's it's not as strong you know if you look at the 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 romans comparatively this big solid oak with deep roots going into the ground where the seleucids are sort of like this big bramble bush but the roots roots only go down you know half a foot yes and i think you've, there's, um, there's a difference here you've mentioned something which is you know key which is the 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 fundamental ethnic unity of the romans versus the for lack of a better word multicultural nature of the seleucid empire which is the inheritance of the achaemenid empire and with it the system of satrapies um in terms of like greek colonization to the empire um antioch was of course the the, the major center and there was a strong hellenic presence in anatolia and in Syria, and of course, these are the regions most inclined to be loyal to the, um, the Seleucid dynasty. And this, in a way, accounts for what would happen later. Ironically, we have the um, uh, Seleucid dynasty at its height during Antiochus the Great. And as a result of this treaty, um, and as a result, of, again, of the particular nature of the Seleucid Empire, it being basically a Greek dynasty ruling over the, the massive sort of bulk of um, Persian satrapies, um, it's very easy to conquer in that sense. During the reign of um, Mithridates of Parthia, um, in the second century, the middle of the second century BC, 
um, most of the Seleucid lands would be um, taken by the Parthians, who would basically, Mephrodates would establish himself in um, Babylon as the king of kings and attempt to, you know, restore some sort of link with the um, Achaemenid dynasty. Um, at the same time, in Kiel, Syria, you have the uh, Maccabean revolt in 163, which results in the resurgence of an independent Judea. So the as a result of this, you know, within, you know, less than 100 years after the um, battle, well, really about 50 years, after the um, the Treaty of Apema, the Seleucid Empire has been reduced down to Syria, basically Syria, and within that yeah. territory, there are also constant civil wars as well. And so, so we uh, might um, we might argue that in a sense, um, because looking at this, you know, like you say, the parallels between you know Alexander and, and Darius are are clear. You know, so the Romans are sort of um, um, militarily, I guess, sort of. Um, um, taking on the role of the Macedonians under Alexander and, and the, the Greeks conversely have become, um, um, you know, the rulers of this vast Eastern kingdom. But then again, we also see um, that the Romans in some sense become, um, they take up the mantle as the guardians of this, um, this Western or, or Greek culture. And, um, and um, yeah, the kingdoms like the Seleucid empire fall to um, um, Parthians and, and, and um, a resurgent Judea, as you say, um, which I just, I think that's really interesting to see how um, these, these roles shift, you know? Yes, funny, and I think, funny. So, sorry, um, Marcus. I was just going to say funny that comparison is made because uh, just as a sort of a, and a thought, as a thought, as an aside, what's kind of interesting here is because we spoke about Greece last week and sort of the fractured nature of the of the polyes of the various Greek states, the the various city states, the and and as we've moved on, we obviously have the the kingdoms of the the, the successor states of Alexander in the form of the you know the Macedonian kingdom, the Seleucid kingdom, the Ptolemaic kingdom specifically. Is that Rome isn't always unified, but what Rome does do, which the Greeks don't do, is the Romans become prevalent. They conquer their Latin Italic neighbours and become the hegemon, the undisputed hegemon of Italy, and they become a regional power as a result of that. The, the Romans accomplish something that no Greek power does, and then the Romans harness that power of that, that you, you mentioned before, that we touched on sort of like the the, the ethnos, the unity of, of this sort of uh, cultural uh, sort of blood unity of the of the people that make up the roman state in italy and then the romans can project their power outwards which is something which is a luxury not afforded to in this case specifically the seleucids and to some degree not macedon and certainly not the ptolemies as well yes and i think i think we really have to move on because we're, we're running out of time uh, yeah. but, and again I, I take all your points and, and again it's significant to note again the the internal composition and why the greek world failed where's the roman world not only succeeded but you know was Correct. able to win complete victory um moving on to as as you mentioned the you could you could say the change in roman attitudes away from this um idea of the the freedom of the greeks towards the subjugation of the greeks um not long after the Treaty of Apopamia, uh, we have the final Macedonian Wars, the third one, the fourth one, and the Achaean War. Um, as we mentioned, during during both wars, um, Philip V had, you know, first of all, he had fought the Romans, and eventually during the Seleucid Wars, he would come to basically be a Roman ally in order to retain control of his various territories. Um, after he dies, he is succeeded by his son Perseus, and from 171 until 68, Perseus um, conducts the third Macedonian War. And um, he attempts to, you know, regain and conquer Thessaly again. And in response to this, um, the Romans under um, uh, Callinicus uh, defeat him at the Battle of Pydna in, uh, sorry, um, under Aemilius rather, um, in, in the year 168. And to make this even worse, um, Perseus becomes a Roman prisoner and is you know, brought over to Rome. Aemilius is given a triumph and the Antigonid dynasty is basically extinguished as a result of this, you know, what the Romans consider, consider to be this um, act of violating the treaty. And Macedon, rather than again having a Roman client king put on it, um, Macedon was partitioned into four republics. And as far as I believe, there was also a massive extraction of slaves, especially from Epirus, um, hundreds of thousands of slaves. And the, the Romans began to, you know, aggressively um, start exploiting the mining potential Macedonia at the same time and I think you know again we we see this around the, um, the same time of the Carthaginian Wars we're about to enter the third Punic War um, where the Roman elite is 
Rome, Roman society in general has been transformed into this massive slave society. And I think this also contributes to it, but also the fact that Rome is, you know, it's gone beyond just um, this policy of almost acting as the arbiter of mm. um, arbitrator of Greek affairs towards actively I I I intervening in Greek affairs. And this, you know, doesn't stop here. Um, we have the, the so-called pretender Andriscus, um, who conducts the fourth Macedonian war. Um, only to be defeated at a second battle of Pydna. And as a result, the um, the Achaean League goes to war against Rome, ostensibly because they believe that, you know, Rome is being, you know, far too expansionist. But um, Polybius, um, you know, has, you know, has, of course, written the, the most iconic, the histories on the um, the conquest of Greece and, you know, lumped scorn at the, the various leaders of the, um, the League, you know, accusing them of demagoguery. Basically, the demagoguery was responsible for the, the loss of the Achaean League. Nevertheless, um, the Achaean League is very summarily defeated by the Romans. If the Romans could defeat the Seleucids, if the Romans could defeat the Macedonians, they could very easily defeat the Achaean League. And in response to this, you know, a very decisive and one-sided war, the Romans utterly destroy the city of Corinth, as you can see there in that painting. And again, in terms of relating this back to Carthage and how you know Greek affairs and Punic affairs actually bear quite a few parallels, uh, Carthage is destroyed in 149, you know, famous Carthage with the land west. And Corinth is also destroyed in 146 in a very similar way, again, to act as an abject lesson in the total subjugation of the people. So a complete about turn from this, um, um, again, Flaminius uh, proclaiming the freedom of the Greeks at Isthmus towards the conquering of Greece and of course from 146 onwards Greece will be incorporated into the Roman as, as you mentioned Columba uh, Provincia of Macedon and it would only be some cities such as um, uh, Athens that would remain partial autonomy but basically the ancient Greek the Greek city-state system is basically over at this point yeah I, I, and then and then we see um it's interesting because we've talked a lot about Polybius and and the express purpose of Polybius's histories was to sort of explain in Greek to the Greeks the the, the conquest um, of the Romans and you see him you know a lot um, you know explaining how how legions work and what these things mean so it was clearly intended for for a Greek audience and Polybius is interesting because after all of this um, I believe Polybius's father was a guy called Lycortes who was um, um, fought for um, um, Philip V um, I, I, and so um after these defeats, um, the Macedonian defeats and the Roman victories, um, I believe a thousand Greek nobles were brought um, to Italy and Polybius was among these. And um, Polybius actually became a sort of teacher um, in the house of the Scipios and became particularly friendly with Scipio Emilianus, who was, um, if I'm not mistaken, responsible for the final sort of destruction of um, of Carthage. Um, and, and so he's writing this, um, this sort of... Um, sympathetic history i guess i mean I, 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 and he does he does at least trying to portray himself as being quite fair you know but we must always be um, um aware i suppose of who is who is patron is so I, ju I just thought i'd note that there marcus marcus um, yeah sorry no no i uh yeah no i agree with what columbia to say i don't really have much to add because i know you're a bit pressed so i will only add where i <laughs> i feel i can um, oh, oh, oh well one, one thing i would say is that i don't think it was just one province i believe it was split into two provinces it was before. split Achaea... into provinces later akia was a augustinian creation oh it was my originally God. Okay. um Macedo oh no it's fine it's a, it's a trivial point in the grand scheme of things what i what i will say though is from the from the the standpoint of a Roman traditionalist, what is a sad thing to see is this transformation. I have, I mean, Columba actually talked about, you know, Pietas and Fidelis earlier in the chat tonight, and I have referenced the Mos Maiorum in a few of our previous conversations. There is a sort of a real tragic transformation that occurs here where the Romans really start to abandon, you might say, these, these early moralities, which they did make a point of adhering to. And to use an analogy, it's a case of as if the Roman wolf has got a taste of blood on its teeth, and now that it's sunk its uh, its teeth into the into the riches and of, of Greece, and it has its first taste of empire, we I think it's safe to say that Rome takes a trajectory here, which it you know it doesn't abandon for the next uh, you know 100 years, 150 years, and for the for those who are interested, 
one thing to take into consideration is whether it's the Macedonian Wars, whether it's the Cart the Punic Wars, whether it's the wars in Gaul or Iberia, from from the from the end of Caesar's rule, and if you go back two hundred years, the Romans achieve or the Romans host seventy triumphs in two hundred years. Now, to host the triumph, a commander has to kill a minimum of five thousand enemy sol- uh, you know, enemies, enemies, enemy soldiers, whatever. So take that into account and extrapolate the casualties in your mind as to as to the 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 savagery and the aggression of the romans at this standpoint yeah it, it's, it's it's interesting because as 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 the these roman traditions break down and the roman focus on piety seems to sort of slip away um when this new wealth comes in this is the beginning i mean i mean um um of the family of scipio africanus at this exact time um we have the gracchi uh, and um and indeed um i believe scipio emilianus is is criticized somewhat for the way that he handled things in car in um, north africa i can't remember the exact details but um tiberius gracchus um was serving on his staff at the time and obviously there's loads of correspondence going back and forth between you know the armies and, and the people in rome you know people want to know what their, their their son's up to i suppose um I, I, and it's at this time that um gracchus sort of wins wins favor for his his more sort of um lenient i suppose approach he doesn't want um to 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 brutalize the carthaginians in the way that emilianus does and so there's this sort of i suppose association um beginning with the populists and and sort of this uh, this rejection of this new avarice um which is all taking place at this at this exact time as well so i just i thought that would be really fascinating to know and, I also uh, believe. Sorry, Marcus. I keep oh, no, just gonna, no, no, you're, you're fine. Um, uh, just one last thing too, because you just while well, I had it on my mind, you mentioned about the massive influx of slaves from Epirus and from Macedon into Rome, and this is also in a, an approximate conjunction with the influx of slaves that would have been taken from the final destruction of the Carthaginian. Absolutely, Republic. these two things are coinciding. Exactly, and. In the chat that we had about Gaul, I did touch on the socio-demographic collapse of Rome. We have two concurrent things happening at once. You have the this attrition, which sort of uh, culminates in the in the Cimbrian Wars, where the Romans suffer over successive generations these quite uh, profound defeats at the face of various enemies. Which and and in the in terms of the Republican army, these are soldiers levied from these are citizen, often farmer soldiers that have land, which are family owning um, or, or land owning families, and they go to war and they die, and in many cases they don't have sons or they're not replenished or what have you. Over the course of centuries of attrition, between those losses suffered by that particular class of Roman citizen, with the mass influx of slaves into the Roman Republic. And the vast majority of the slaves are acquired by aristocrats. At the same time, the Roman aristocrats have acquired uh, massive scores of farmland in Italy, you know, penny on the dime, uh, sorry, uh, penny on the dollar. And so you have all these various little things falling into place that sort of bring us to, I know we're not talking about Rome, but like maybe if we touch on it in a future stream, you have the, the, the circumstances of the social war and of the Marian reforms and then the eventual collapse of the Republic. Well, that's, that's um, interestingly, again, is an interesting allusion to our next discussion, which is going to be the Mithridatic Wars, um, oh, excellent. Which, which, which coincide quite nicely with that. It was smooth. I like that. Yes. <laughs> so um, you mentioned your know, various means of Roman expansion. Um, I, I think it's also important to note that um, Rome has established, of course, many client states and one means of roman expansion was also that periodically various client kings would will their kingdom you know sometimes in the absence of an heir to the roman republic so in 133 attalus the third of pergamon and as we mentioned pergamon was essential in the macedonian the seleucid wars yes wills very strong kingdom, ally of rome yes wills his kingdom and therefore a huge chunk of anatolia to Rome, and that forms the um, province of Asia. Even though, again, that um, immediately causes a succession war uh, with the uh, with the relatives of Attalus. Nevertheless, the Romans put it down, and they establish a definitive um, provincial presence in the uh, in Asia Minor, Anatolia. Now, just to give you a little bit of context on uh, the Mithridatic dynasty and j- just the general situation in Anatolia, um, as you. Uh, can see the capital of the Kingdom of Pontus is Sinope. And as far as I believe, um, Sinope was originally a Roman polis, you know, dating back from, you know, the 600 BC. 
Um, so I, I think it's fair to say that Pontus was relatively Hellenized, uh, even did though. You mean, did you mean Greek? Sorry. Uh, yes. Yeah, so, sorry. I was going to say 600 BC. <laughs> those those Romans got around, you know. But... Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, and it also bears an interesting distinction of being a former Achaemenid satrap, yet not having been a Alexandrian satrap. Um, Alexander had very little influence over northern Anatolia and the Caucasus. And so these regions in the kingdom of Bithynia um, were basically independent, as you saw with the Seleucids. The Seleucid interest and the Ptolemaic interest was, of, and you know, Rhodesian and Pergamon were very much in Western and Southern Asia, um, Asia Minor, as opposed to the North. But nevertheless, these kingdoms were um, uh, Hellenized to quite a substantial degree in terms of yeah, the. Yeah, I actual... mean, there's a, there's a just a little, a little addition to that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, these these areas, you know, the areas around the Black Sea and Colchis, these places have a a huge place in uh, in Greek myth. I mean, famously, um, Colchis on the opposite side of the Black Sea from Anatolia, that's where um, Jason got the golden yes. fleece, you know, in the Argonauts. So, so there's all there's there's yeah, there's a long history of um and of, of course, Greek and of course, here. Pontus is the Greek god of the sea as well. Yeah, correct. And also Pontus uh, in the speaking of Pontus, when uh, when Xenophon is ten thousand make it back from Persia, when they reach the outskirts of Trapezus, they proclaim Thalassa the sea. So yes, there are many um, many allusions to to Pontus and its link with the Hellenic world. So um, again, just in terms of like establishing that, then we get to the um, the Mithridatic Wars. And this begins with a, um, a dispute between um, the kingdoms of Bithynia and Pontus, and they ask Rome to arbitrate. Now, this is like con quite con quite um, controversial in terms of who started that war. But I think it's basically been established that um, Nicomedes the Fourth, who is the the king of Bithynia, all the Romans were responsible for basically um, violating their own peace with Pontus, and that the Roman troops in the event of war between Bithynia and Pontus had been told to side with Bithynia and were promised a huge amount of loot as well. So again, talking about the decline of um, Roman morals, fidelis yeah. <laughs> and Roman morals, uh, the Romans basically go on a plundering campaign um, into um, eastern, into the, um, the the western parts of Pontus, and you know the Bithynians are also very happy with this because this is fundamentally um, weakening their um, their longtime ally. And um, Mithridates originally, uh, Mithridates the Fourth originally um, tries to come up with some sort of peaceful solution by um, asking the Romans to um, stay their legions. Uh, by the way, the Mithridatic dynasty you know is, is ethnically Persian, but like I said, presiding over a, um, a relatively um, Hellenized dynasty. They were part of the... Yeah, they, um, they began as satraps, right? Yes, they began as um, ancient Persian satraps. So, you know, again, as a link to the Achaemenids and also the Greeks with the, the kingdom of Pontus. And this is where we have um, one of the most infamous moments in, you know, Roman history, which are the Asiatic Vespers in 88. Um, owing to his failure to reconcile the situation, um, Mithridates is able to orchestrate the massacre of Roman and Italic citizens throughout Asia Minor. And this is done through you know, new various means, including like setting up a slave revolt of the, um, the Roman slaves against their masters. And the, the intention of this is to completely wipe out a Roman presence to allow Mithridates to have basically control of Anatolia and to prevent the Romans from coming back and basically defeating them in one fell swoop. And I believe the massacre is responsible for 125,000 people around that number. Anything that's between what that? the That's what the ancient sources say. Yeah, about 80,000 to 120,000. Hmm. It so, sort of um, almost stands, uh, stands up as being the first intentional instance of genocide if you think about yes. it yes in many ways yes well i mean i would argue that genocide in a, in a, happened a, every a, weekend at this time in a, but, in a non-military context if you know if you know, take away like sieges and whatever you know yes. like the, mm. if you consider this as an intentional insurrection almost a civil revolt based upon the killing of Romans specifically there's there's an in, there's an interesting kind of historical precedent here mm. and um it's interesting in the fact it begins as a Pontic, a, again, uprising against the, the Romans in Anatolia, but it also extends into a general Greek uprising against the Romans. As we mentioned, they had just recently been subjugated. So in addition to, you know, amassing vast control over Anatolia, um, there is the 
um, re rebellion by um, Athenion, Athenion in Athens, um, which leads to the war basically coinciding, the first Mithridatic war basically coinciding on Greek soil. Um, so the Pontic forces under Mithridates and um, Archelaus um, you know, arrive in Greece, and again, ostensibly Mithridates is positioning himself again as another liberator of the Greek peoples. Mm. And this time it is Sulla, one of the you know most important consequential Romans who would later become dictator, who is able to defeat Archelaus at um, uh, Chaeronia and at um, Orochomenus. And again, in terms of the instability of the Roman Republic, you would have thought that in response to the Asiatic Vespers, the Romans would have had a, you know, a ferocious zeal to completely consolidate and conquer Asia Minor at this time in response to this, you know, um, deliberate act of what can say, you know, among other words, you know, genocide against mm -hmm. the Romans. Yet, the Romans were, were distracted. We might say yes. The Romans are embroiled in the um, the social war, which is going along, are going on at this time. And Sulla, I believe, despite being um, victorious against Mithridates, of course, he's the um, head of the Optimatis faction. The um, yes, he has to return to faction. Rome. Um, he has been declared an outlaw, whilst he's also trying to um, deal with the um, the situation with Mithridates. So the the peace terms are actually incredibly generous. They basically establish the. Um, the borders as they were of the Kingdom of Pontus before the war. And um, Sulla goes back and, of course, he marches on Rome twice and is established as the um, dictator and then... Deals with Marius. Yeah. Deals with the Marian faction, again, spawning out of the social situation after the um, the the second Pun the Third Punic War and the Gracchus Brothers, etc., etc., etc. So, um, as you can see, the political situation of Rome is now, you know, very much impacting on the Greek world as well. And you mm -hmm. can say, you know, Mithridates VI chose the best time to annex all these territories and liberate Greece. Fascinatingly, though, Sulla, despite all of these setbacks and despite the fact he was declared an outlaw by the Marian faction, is still able to defeat Mithridates. Which again, well, he wasn't well. Um, he wasn't called Felix for nothing. <laughs> exactly. Testament to um, Roman supremacy at the same time. So, um, and again, peace 85, the peace of Dardanos, which um, uh, establishes, you know, um, status quo at Bellum. Um, so there, are, there, there are, sorry, I just, there are a couple of points I would, I, would, I guess, make. And, and one thing that, that I suppose we see here, and it would be interesting to see if you guys agree, is that every figure that comes along who proclaims himself, um, you know, the leader of the Greeks against um, the Romans, you know, be it um, Antiochus before this or um, um, now Mithridates um, or the Mithridatoi, um, they, 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 the leaders themselves are getting less and less Greek and in their, and in their um, um, calling on the resources of the East to battle the Romans, they're almost sort of... Um, selling their greek soul if you will you know until we get to the point where we have mithridates who you know i, I mean look at this bust that we have of him he has you know the lion helm clearly trying to imitate alexander but he's not a greek himself he's, he's you know a descendant of the satrapies he's 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 renowned for you know tactics you know poison he got called the poison king of pontus you know um tactics that um you know the the the, the older the old macedonians would have would have looked down on you know um and his, even his name i mean mithridates is a greek Greek version of um, you know, it means sort of um the given or or the or the chosen of Mithras, you know. Yes. Um so 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 it's a it's an Iranian sort of um Zoroastrian name. And so I, I don't know what, what what do you guys think about that? The, the the more resistance we see, these figures themselves are becoming less and less Greek and more and more Eastern as, as a result. Well, I think it's the natural result of the you know the Roman conquest of the of the Western Greeks. And as we said, you know, with the Hellenic Age, as a result of the Alexandrian conquest the orientalization of the Greeks is, is going to be the, you know, the, the result of that. And we're going to see as the Romans expand, um, this appeal to being leader of all the Greeks as with Mithridates the um, fourth is a savvy political maneuver in the sense that again, it's calling on a larger pile of resources than you can currently muster in your position as um, King of Pontus. And of course, the the last sort of um, Hellenic um, Hellenic character we're going to encounter, um, who you can almost say you know, stands as the the last bastion of Hellenic civilization, is of course Cleopatra, who is even more you know orientalized than um, 
Mithridates to some extent with her position as um, as, as pharaoh of Egypt. So it, yes, I think it's just a, a matter of the the Roman expansion and the Hellenized and the, all these Hel Helen, 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 sorry Hellenic kingdoms spawning across the east. Indeed, and I think the other thing as well is it's reflect it's reflective of the geography in which these wars have been taking place. I mean, you look at Aeos and Kynocephale moving eastwards against these these battles. I mean, the the first battle with uh, Mithridates obviously fought at um at a uh, how do you pronounce it? Gosh, uh, it's a one Thank you, Kiraneo, um, against Sulla, which is actually on mainland Greece. But m most of the rest of the battles are fought in a Asia Minor, and they're fought progressively eastwards. And we we touched on this when we, we were talking about um, the Bronze Age. And you have this intersection with the Bronze Age between a Hellenized Western portion and a more Eastern sort of Oriental Iranian portion, and how Anatoly becomes this sort of melting pot between the two and even though the uh, the the persian realm is no more and the greeks are eventually conquered uh, the western portions by rome uh, and obviously in the east parthia triumphs over the the seleucids but anatolia from this point on basically remains a greek portion of the world for another millennia and a half after this this series of wars and it's just, like I said, it's just reflective of the fact that it's just the geography in which these wars have been taking place to sort of gradually move eastwards as the as the Greek Roman struggle, you know, plays on. Yes, and I can just I can just elaborate on that just slightly. So of course we have the um, the first Mithridatic War. The second Mithridatic War is you know a bit of a non-entity. Again, it's coinciding at this time, you know, the late the late eighties BC. Um, with this time of major social upheaval, uh, social upheaval, so it's the third Mithridatic War, which is you know the longest of all these wars, which um, is probably the most substantial. Um, in the the wake of the death of Nicomedes the Fourth, the king of Bithynia, who had arguably started all of this, um, as in the fashion of Roman client kingdoms, he bequeaths his kingdom to Rome. And Mithridates sees this as basically an act of aggression on the part of the Romans in the sense that they are further encroaching upon his territory, having established, you know, a peace with various buffer states, including Bithynia. And so he tries to wrestle control of Bithynia, but is defeated Nicomedia. And in response, um, uh, Lucullus drives um, Mithridates, and again, I've noticed on this picture that I've, this PowerPoint I've designed, I've got the Roman numerals wrong, so apologies for that. It's not six, it is four. Um, Lucullus um, is, uh, defeats Mithridates at the Battle of Cabria, and as a result of this, he loses his kingdom again and um, flees to the Armenian king, uh, Tigranes the Great, uh, to give you a bit of background on Tigranes the Great, Tigranes the Great is also responsible for the annexation of the Seleucid Empire at the same time. As I mentioned, the Seleucids have been reduced to this um, rump in Syria, and Tigranes, on one side of the civil war, of which there are many in the Greek world, enters and basically establishes control in 883. So he has a great empire corresponding with his ally Mithridates and so Lucullus moves from Anatolia into Armenia and is able to defeat Tigranes at um, Tigranokerta and um, Artaxata in 6.9 and 6.80 um, and again this is testament to the tenacity of Mithridates you know he loses his kingdom at um, Kibera um, but he regains his kingdom at Zela only to be defeated by one of the you know, great protagonists of the next phase of Roman history, Pompey the Great, who would later become a um, triumvir. Yeah, and, and I think in some ways, perhaps um, Mithridates, I mean, with all this traveling around and him remaining this implacable enemy, um, I don't know, it, it, it smells of Hannibal to me, you know? I, I get, oh yes, I get, I'll, I'll tell you. His, the same vibe, I suppose. Yes, I'll, I'll show you his commitment. You already mentioned the fact he was the... Um, the the poisoner king well of course he had famously you know tr tried to make himself immune to poison by taking various antidotes and various like half measures of poison throughout his entire life i believe when he tries to kill himself he tries to poison himself and he's unable to poison himself yes yes he's like walking these... around he's walking yes. around the room trying to quicken quicken the poison but it won't work yeah. <laughs> all these measures he's taken but no he's reduced and this is again in terms of like the endurance of the greek world he retreats to um the north as you can see he retreats to crimea and one of his sons um 
goes above his head and tries to establish himself as a client king of um of the Cimmerian Bosporus um in Pantacapium, which again was a um originally a Greek colony, and this is again a very Hellenized region. And Mithridates, of course, who uses the betrayal, kills his son only to be betrayed by a, another son, Pharnaces II, which finally induces um Mithridates in 67 to um to um kill um to, to to request his death at the hand of you mentioned the Galatians well it is a um a Gaul Batuitus who finally kills him in the end I think you know well into his seventies at this point so we have there you know the end of one of um Rome's most tenacious enemies and you know, the the conquests of Rome don't stop at this point Pompey establishes a Roman province in Pontus and you know, that would later become the province of um Bithynia at Pontus and as we mentioned the armenians had just taken over um the rump state in syria well of course that crumbles as a result of the campaigns of lucullus and pompey marches into syria and after trying to again manage the the various um, factional strife simply again annexes it in 63 bc so we have this massive um expansion into the um the asiatic hellenized provinces in the roman world and this is where we really get to the the final stage of the um the roman conquest of the greek world which is that of the um the ptolemaic kingdom which is the last yeah. of the the three great powers also, just on that I, map too just before you flick over the map you've got uh the province of Kalikia at the bottom there on that southern anatolian coast pompey also destroys the Kalikian pirates at that point as well yes and which was when some great Empire. fame correct um i i would just say um to some extent um, um because he doesn't get enough credit um a lot of pompey's victories are in some sense a consolidation or mopping up of um lucullus's early successes but yes exactly yeah. and, and so um, it's, it's, it's often forgotten but the battle that's actually t that actually takes place on the outskirts of tigrano curta is arguably one of the greatest victories of the uh, of the republican era the, yes, I think the Armenian there. army is considerably larger than the Romans, and the Romans still managed to vanquish them. So Lucullus is probably one of the most underrated of all the Roman generals. Definitely, so. yeah. Mm. I mean, he so, just yes. keeps going east. I mean, and you've got to remember, um, yeah, the, the, the Romans didn't have a big hand in Asia at the time, and so him just um, continually striking east, let's go into Armenia. It's, it's very impressive. Um, and very one, uh, one other thing that I would note about Pompey's um, conquests before we get on, um, because it's, it's, it's um, you know, I mean, we're we're Christians here. Um, Pompey actually, you know, he takes Judea, and he um he, they go to the temple, right? Um, and, and then the story goes that apparently, um, you know, they're expecting loads of treasures and cult statues, and he goes into the um, you know, after slaughtering some of the priests, and the priests are jumping off of the temple mount. Um, Pompey himself apparently um strode in, you know, in his armor into the into the um the holiest of holies in the center of the temple and found nothing there. You know, just a sort of um, yeah, you know, an empty um stillness. Um, and it, and it, this must have um, um, sort of put him off. You know, as a pagan, he had never seen anything like this, and so he he left. And I'm pretty sure he ordered um, he ordered the damage to stop or something like this. But um, uh, it's 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 a it's a very um interesting story and i think something that um if anyone's interested in some of the developments that led to um you know the events of christ's life then then that that's an interesting area to start because this is this really marks um the beginnings of roman interaction in earnest with the jewish world yes and of course this moves on nicely to the relationship with um Antony, because of course um Herod the Great is going to be a great admirer of Antony. So indeed, move, indeed. move briskly move briskly on to um to the the final phase which is the the life and times of um uh Cleopatra of the um of the Ptolemaic dynasty um again another interesting point to note is as with all of these various client kingdoms Rome invariably has diplomatic um relations with all of these and you know strong interest in all of these so as with the Seleucids as with the various kings in um Greece uh, the Ptolemy Ptolemies are routinely in a state of civil war and that's basically demonstrated by the number of Ptolemies I believe there are 14 Ptolemies um, Cleopatra's father, um, Ptolemy the Twelfth, um, had been deposed um, from Alexandria, and he had actually lived in Rome alongside, you know, Cleopatra, who was then a who was then a baby. And um, it is in that position that he receives Roman funds in order to um, reconquer his kingdom in fifty five. 
um, while the Romans were also conquering Cyprus, which is which had been a um, Ptolemaic possession and a Egyptian possession in general for um, hundreds, if not thousands, of years years up until this point. And so her father rules as this restored client king of the Romans from 55 until 51 until he finally dies and he decides to make um, Ptolemy the third and Cleopatra the seventh joint rulers of the um, of the kingdom now just an important point to note um, the Ptolemates adopted some of the customs on the one hand Alexandria was you know one of the most um, Hellenized and you could almost say it was, the, it was the center of the Hellenic world at this point so it's quite fitting that this conquest of the Greek world should end with Alexandria um, at the same time, the Egyptian Ptolemies were mainly speaking Greek. I believe Cleopatra, and this is Cleopatra the seventh, because there were many Cleopatras before her, um, was the only um, queen of Egypt who could actually speak the local vernacular. And yes. by Greek, of course, there was many Koine Greek, which was the, the basically means common Greek, which was the development of the Alexandrian Wars. And so, and yet, they also practiced some very Egyptian customs at the same time. So, the reason Ptolemy the Third and Cleopatra were made joint rulers was the expectation that they were going to become consorts. They were going to become. Um, Yes, this is this is another reason for the decline of the Hellenistic dynasties. Yes, there's, a lot of, um, is... there's a lot of Alabama-style marriages going well, on. Well, well, like you said, AM, there was several uh, Ptolemies, and very, very, very many of them married their sisters. <laughs> yes, very many Ptolemies marrying Cleopatras, and this is this is no exception. And this sort of again fits nicely on from our discussion with um, Pompey the Greeks, of course as we've alluded to um caesar has come back from gaul he has crossed the rubicon he is now fighting um the civil war of the senate and pompey the great has been made the, the leader of the senate faction and he is defeated by caesar at the battle of pharsalus now counting on this client king relationship with um the previous roman client king ptolemy the 12th he goes to egypt in 48 of uh, believing that his son Ptolemy III would um, you know, give him sanctuary. And of course, um, one of the things that um, Ptolemy III does is execute, um, execute Pompey. And um, Caesar would later arrive and um, occu occupy the city. And as well, one thing was considered the various civil wars, um, Ptolemy III and Cleopatra start a civil war almost, almost immediately. And Caesar arrives in Egypt chasing Pompey, only to find himself embroiled in this um, civil the war. Alexandrian between the Alexandrian War, yeah. Yes, the Alexandrian War between the Egyptian factors. And um, it's actually Ptolemy who starts the war against Caesar when he believes that he's going to take um, Cleopatra aside and lay siege to Caesar in Alexandria. Uh, Caesar, of course, overcomes this and is able to decisively defeat Ptolemy and his half sister Arsinoe at the yes, um and, the battle of the nile and the um the the famous story on why cause, because as you say caesar was supporting um um the younger brother apparently the um, so so we are told um one of cleopatra's slaves um um carried cleopatra um wrapped in, in some cloth or a rug um into caesar's quarters in alexandria and unrolled it on the floor and he was captivated and, and um and uh, this 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 um started their alliance and not only their alliance their dalliance you know i mean they have they have children together caesar and cleopatra yes yeah, caesarian is um born very swiftly after um they they interact you know almost immediately um they start an effect caesarian is born in 47 and after um caesar defeats um uh, ptolemy of course continuing on this practice um cleopatra then marries her even younger brother Ptolemy the fourth and makes her her co-ruler. Nevertheless, she actually returns and um, lives in Rome. I believe even in Caesar's villa for um, for two years from four six until four four. And this, of course, causes a huge amount of controversy um, yes. with the um, the senatorial faction, um, who of course will later be responsible for the assassination of Caesar in four four. Yes, and and this is um this is where we get on to um, the triumvirate, and, and so I have a lot to say about that. So after you, yes, so um well, well yes, you you mentioned the triumvirate. Of course, this is the creation of the the second triumvirate. Um, if I'm right, it's Mark Antony, Octavian, Octavian, of course, who is um Caesar's adoptive heir, but you know biological nephew, and um who is the third? Lepidus. Mark, yes, Lepidus is the the third um of the of the triumvirs, and um. 
Cleopatra, of course, sides with the, the second triumvirate as she has a vested interest in the Caesarian faction winning, of course, due to the claims of her son, who is the, as we as far as consider, the only known biological son of um, Julius Caesar. And um, it is shortly after this, um, after the War of the Liberators in 4-1, uh, where you have the first meeting of Mark Antony and Cleopatra. And very soon afterwards, um, they begin their affair. And I believe Mark Antony is already married to Octavia, Octavia Minor. Yes. Octavia Minor at this point, and this causes a huge strain on the relationship between the um, the Octavian faction and the the Mark Antony faction at the same time, um, because again, it's it's an insult to to Roman honor and um, fidelity and pietas. As, well, as it, yeah, I, I mean, this 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 is what I wanted to get into here, right? Because Lepidus um, Lepidus gets control of Africa, right? Basically, yeah. Carthage and its old territories, but not Egypt um augustus or octavian gets um italy you know gaul spain and then um antony gets the east you know um all of these eastern conquests that we've discussed here now this is this is really interesting because um the senatorial faction has been roundly whipped at this point you know after these civil wars um you know brutus and cassius are gone and, and, and so forth um and so the popular faction is um uh, undoubtedly in control they've, they've effectively won but it, but but the per the person of caesar had always combined um the sort of more scurrilous theatrical and foreign side of the populist coin with um you know the the, the populism of the gracchi say um he managed to sort of combine these two um these two forces in roman populism i mean there there are, there are these two there are two letters um supposedly from sullust to caesar um, and Sallust was supposedly one of the more respectable um, populists, and he was begging Caesar to, you know, um, stop hanging around with these theatrical men. I, I, and Caesar, Caesar said, you know, if these men help me get my power, then I will, I'll stick by them. You know, he stuck to his guns with this sort of synthesis. But after Caesar's um, assassination, it sort of falls apart, and so you get you see the populist faction being split, and um, Antony takes on the you know the, the the theatrical side the greek side the foreign side um as a vehicle to, to maintain his his power and and augustus or octavian um takes the other side right and, and he tries to appeal to um the senatorials the equites um and the more respectable sort of money plebeians you know um and, and this this begins even um even even um maybe a little bit earlier strictly because i mean Oct octavia who you mentioned augustus's sister she's married off to antony and um, rumors begin to swirl in Rome, cr criticisms, which we assume were, you know, encouraged by Augustus, critiquing Antony and Octavia, you know, for um for dressing in, in slippers and silk and you know Greek clothes uh, and and taking up these these Eastern affectations. And so we we can see we can see Augustus um um using this to increase his own power and, and build on you know we all know about Augustus's idea of um you know you know with his moral laws and such like trying to establish romanitas you know and strengthen yeah. it so so it all comes down to this sort of um this division and this is a big part of why um in my opinion a big part of why antony does so well in the east because we must remember of course um for for you know two centuries at this point um we have we have had massive eastern influence within rome itself and and, and you know the the plebeians have tribes we even have um, um voting tribes for freedmen at this point you know and there's the you know um, geltzer one of the you know big 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 caesar historians he says that um um you know one of the reasons why caesar could succeed is because for many roman plebeians so-called roman plebeians who in actuality were carthaginians or, or greeks or easterners um they could only express rulership through this macedonian or persian you know um god king idea um and so these forces had penetrated into the heart of rome itself and so um in order for antony to maintain his power even in rome he had to resort to these to these eastern ideas Yes, and um, this this sort of continues with you could almost say um, how Antony gets into his fatal um, uh, conflict with um, Octavian in the end because um, he tries following in the spirit of um, Crassus. Of course, Crassus had been um, annihilated at the Battle of Carhe, and um, Cleopatra, in addition to being you know the source of um, not just his strength but Roman strength in the East. Uh, provides him with massive amounts of funds in order to conduct these wars against Parthia. Nevertheless, um, he is defeated in 35. Um, in terms of stabilizing the, the Roman East, as you mentioned, Pompey had very quickly 
annex these vast territories in um, Pontus, in eastern you know, Cappadocia, in Syria, in Armenia, in Judea, and now the Romans have basically had a controlling influence over Egypt. So one of the solutions was the donations of Alexandria. And the reason for this is, as I mentioned, going all the way back to um, Antiochus III, uh, the Seleucids and the Ptolemies had married into each other. So um, Cleopatra had Seleucid blood, and therefore she had a, a claim to the, um, the Seleucid Empire. And so the theory was that Antony's children, you know, by Cleopatra, um, in addition to Caesarion, should have various client kingdoms established in the east, and this would include um, uh, Armenia, Libya, Sicilia, Syria, as well as Egypt, um, basically consolidating the um, the weak Roman control over all of these territories. Um, yet at the same time, the argument was leveled against this, that this was basically um, Mark Antony, you know, a complete betrayal of the Roman ways, attempting to carve out his own monarchical dynasty for himself with Cleopatra, using, you know, his sons basically to um, ostensibly to act as client states, but in reality to um, betray everything that Rome st stood for. Yeah, and, and again, it's, it's this idea of, you know, if you want to resist this resurgent, you know, strong West, um, um, you end up sort of, yeah, becoming a part of the East, you know. And um, of course, sorry, Marcus. Oh, no, I'm just going to say it's worth bearing in mind too, because I can't remember if it was you or Columb who just said it, that... Uh, that Octavian, later Augustus, and Mark Antony were both of the Popularis factions. But it's not just that. They're actually both, in fact, descendants of the Caesarian faction specifically. Yes. And and Antony, by the time of Caesar's assassination, Antony is a, an established um, uh, subordinate of Caesar. He's been bloodied and tested in the Gallic, uh, Gallic Wars, or the latter part of the Gallic Wars, and through the civil wars, he's a very... Uh, somewhat of a brute and a ruffian yeah. but he's 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 proven on the battlefield and, and and very popular amongst the troops and octavian is still rather fresh at the start of the of the triumvirate and over the course of this struggle between well firstly octavian and mark antony against uh, cassius and brutus but then afterwards when it's the second triumvirate between those two and lepidus you sort of see the balance of power shifting and as mark antony adopts these as columba greatly says these eastern affectations and these sort of eastern potentates and sort of is drawn into cleopatra's sort of realm and her way of thinking in the eastern modes of of of, uh, of leadership let's say octavian really does start to become uh the 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 standard bearer of the Roman way for the for the Senate and for the for the Equites and for the the very Italic minded Western Romans of this yes, time. Yes, I also think yeah. it's important to note that um, Octav um, Octavius, dis Octavian, despite the fact, um, as you mentioned, he's quite green in the military affairs, and you can say Mark Antony was above was above him in that sense. Um, he was very fortunate in the fact he had this alliance with Marcus Agrippa. Marcus Agrippa, of course, was you know significantly lowborn compared to um, uh, compared to Octavian. Nevertheless, you know, proved to be you know a tactical genius and also a brilliant architect at the same time. And I believe he is you know principally responsible for the um, Octavian victory at the um, the Battle of Actium. Correct, yeah. and, and probably, of, and more than just an alliance, you might say a, a, a genuine friendship, from what we can tell in the records. Well, well, they also became in-laws eventually at the end, um, as we move on to the imperial phase. But yes, correct. And of course, the one of the major um, catalysts for this complete breakdown relations, um, of course, Cleopatra had been having this ongoing affair with Antony, but it is the the final divorce of um, of Antony to Octavia that completely severs the, um, yeah. the familial link. And again, this echoes very much the same thing that happened with um, Julia and Pompey the Great at the same time when this family link is broken. Um, you know, basically was a result of you know full out war. Um, funny enough, though. The, they were but basically at the beginning you know roughly corresponding size i believe the last war hundreds of thousands of men you know in the case of um octavian it would have been you know core of italy but also um hispania and um gaul and in the case of antony you know the, the full might of the east you know hundreds of thousands of men were um were deployed but also nearly sort of 40 percent of the senate and both consuls went over and allied with antony as well so it's actually remarkable in the grand scheme of things that um the battle was oh the war was relatively over was over in a relatively short amount of time with the battle yeah. of actium in 31. well i mean actium was a was one hell of a battle mm. um 
you know um but but it's it's interesting seeing them because I, I we've already talked about these sort of um um critiques of these eastern affectations but um i mean even the very fact that he had because because anthony is wanting to attach himself as this eastern potentate and he, he needs cleopatra because of her um you know domination of egypt and her connections with the antigonid dynasty right um, Sorry, the Seleucid dynasty, right? But but of course, um, um, by doing this, um, um, not only does he take on these 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 um, cultural affectations, I suppose, but he he is um, clearly suborning himself to a woman, right? Um, which you know there there there's some um, precedent for this in the East and and um, you know in in monarchies more generally, you know, but a woman very can, un Roman. Um, <laughs> yes, but it's extremely <laughs> un Roman. <laughs> and so Augustus can also draw on this, right? It's a, it's a, it's a big, it's a big card. In yes, day. I think it's it's rather interesting again in terms of parallels. Of course, in our Gallic conflict again, we talk about Vercingetorix being the last cry of um, Gallic unity against the Romans. This is a very different means of again coercion and control. And again, the fact that um, Cleopatra was basically controlling Mark Antony to be able to amass this amount of position, uh, this wealth and um, power within the empire. It also it was this. Um, last gasp reassertion of the the ancient sort of line you know all starting with um ptolemy sota and um seleucus nicator um all the way down you know personified in cleopatra and yet you know she is defeated and this is alexandria the siege of alexandria um where both antony and cleopatra will commit suicide and this is the the end of um ptolemaic egypt and with it you know the last major um greekified state and you know, from this position, you know, significantly Octavian um, becomes pharaoh of Egypt, yes. and from this point on, Egypt becomes the direct imperial possession of, of the emperors, and you know, a source of huge amount of wealth, but also um, importantly, grain um, to the city of Rome as well. Yeah, and I would, I would just as a final sort of commentary on this, because this is the last sort of, yeah, I guess, I guess. Um, resistance from a greek state or an eastern state but um i've already mentioned you know the, the, the we've mentioned the vast increases in the slave population and obviously slaves eventually get free of freedmen um and you know we're talking um upwards of a million slaves um since the punic war yeah. um, and so and so what we what we see happening is the is the easternization of um the plebs in rome you know and, and to, to some extent we might say that um um after after this this roman west under augustus after they conquer the east in fact you know the the, the process of the east seeping into rome itself um um continues really until you get the um the mass depopulations um at the end of the empire and this is something i i actually sort of wanted to mention as we get into our final just epilogue which is um how the greeks fared in the roman world is this um Quote by Horace, um, Grecia captive fellow victorin capit, captive Greece conquered her rude conqueror, um, in the sense that she was Easternized and civilized in the, in this Very regard. And, yeah. um, and, and of course, um, Augustus would become Roman emperor in 27, you know, adopting the, the title of princeps or, um, or first citizen, and eventually towards the end of his life, incorporating that with, um, Pontifex Maximus at the same time. Um, just to like, like have a final overview we already mentioned the fact that um egypt would become a you know a, basically a personal possession of the um of, of the of the of the emperor himself and as you can see here um during the reign of augustus you know roman expansion really accelerated in earnest mm. even though as we can see they're still doing it through this process of client kings so as i mentioned in a previous stream with semi-agog and pharaoh uh, byzantium in particular would actually enjoy a huge amount of rights up until the um up until the second century um you know you would have the, you know, in terms of the greek language especially um greek would remain the lingua franca of the empire in the east and even in some parts of italia as well and so this hellenic world this hellenic influence and the prin uh, principal location of alexandria is the the center of greek learning would continue during this period, even though many have accused this period of also representing stagnation in Greek thought, with the exception of um, Neoplatonism in particular, um, yeah. various like Roman emperors such as Hadrian um, would consider himself like the heir to Pericles, and he would invest heavily in the city of Athens and um, complete the Olympian Temple of Zeus and build Hadrian's library. Um, other emperors such as you know Nero 
um, who I believe wanted to be like a Greek actor, um, also, you know, um, proclaimed the, the the freedom of the Greeks at the Olympic Games, a la um, Flaminius. He performed as well. Yes, and performed at the Olympics. And again, that was banned to, um, to non-Greeks as well. So all of these, you know, allusions to um, the, the Greekification of Rome are, are obvious. And in terms of like the, the endurance of um, the Greek state, of course, um, the Roman world sort of organizes the, the Hellenized provinces into senatorial provinces, namely Macedonia, Epirus, um, Achaea, Bithynia, Pontus, Asia, uh, Cyrenaica uh, at Crete, of course, which is um, part Eastern Libya today and the imperial provinces of Egypt, as we mentioned, Sicilia, Cappadocia, Lycia, mm. uh, Pamphylia, and Syria. But um, there is an independent Greek state which maintains a client-state relationship with Rome throughout this, almost the entire time of the empire, which is the kingdom of the Cimmerian Bosporus up here in the north um, with the Greek city of Panticapium. And right from the Mithridatic Wars, as we mentioned, this is the origin of the client um, statehood of um, the Chimera Bosporus Kingdom, as a result of the civil war between the sons of Mithridates IV and the son aligning himself with the Romans. Um, this client-state relationship would last with a couple of interruptions for 430 years. Mm. So this again, this and, and again, the, the trade in slaves being incredibly important for the economy of the Black Sea during this time as well. So Greece would remain, you know, um, as basically the almost the principal cultural bastion possibly in the empire even more so than the italic influence All and right, uh, well this is where i'll let you finish but i have a sort of point which will add on to this quite nicely yeah sure go ahead oh okay so so I, it's sort of a yeah a, a, a little anecdote and then a reflection which comes into this so um um you mentioned Rhodes, right Rhodes was a big um a big greek um um trading power etc but also um it was a great place of learning yeah. Um, particularly for um, public speaking and philosophy, um, um, re the re the, re the rhetoricians there were meant to be the best. Um, and there was there was there was um, uh, a rhetorical teacher there by the name of Apollonius, uh, the son of Molon, and he taught there um, in the first century BC. And uh, amongst his students were uh, was Caesar, um, but also Cicero. And there's an anecdote in I believe it's Plutarch's Life of Cicero where um, he's describing Cicero's training. You know, he's a young man and he comes to to Apollonius and um, he, he you know, they're, they're meant to learn and then they're meant to get up and give a piece of a speech and demonstrate their learning. And there's many Greeks in the class um, and, and some, some, some Romans um, and Cicero stands and, and, and begins declaiming, you know, begins speaking. Um, uh, um, and, and he's so marvelous. Um, he's so good. Um, the Apollonius starts to cry um, and, he, and he starts to sort of um, bash his head and he's frustrated. And um, Cicero asks him, you know, why? Um, you know, did I not do well, master? And Apollonius says, no, you did incredibly well. Um, the only problem is now I see that um, not only are they content to take our kingdoms and our military glories from us, but the Romans are even going to take, you know, the glories of speaking philosophy mm. and learning from the Greeks. Mm. And so there was this idea um, on behalf of the Greeks that even though they had lost their kingdoms, at least they could be in some way, you know, still culturally um, relevant and philosophically relevant. Uh, and it's also interesting that this is Cicero because you're, you're right when you when you say that Greek um, remains the language of you know learning in the East and to some extent in the West, but Cicero in particular, I think Apollonius was probably right when he started crying because Cicero was the first to begin in earnest, you know, um, in bulk translate um, Aristotle, Plato, um, translate all of this into Latin. Um, he writes his own philosophical dialogues and treatises in Latin, which is impeccably elegant. You know, it's Cicero. Um, and, and, and this begins, obviously, the Western tradition of, um, and you'd had you know, a couple of Latin authors before Cicero, but nobody really major apart from poets. Uh, and so this begins the Western scholarly academic Latin tradition, which persists through Boethius into the scholastics. But in the East, um, um, yeah, you don't have this influence, but there was this recognition um, 
um, that the Romans were sort of even taking that from them. And it's kind of, in a way, I suppose it makes me think of um, our situation as British people, um, now that we've been eclipsed by the Americans, you know, um, there's this idea, oh, well, we still have British films or, or what have you, you know, and it, it's just, I suppose it's a cope in the parlance of our times. Mm, well, wonderful. Thank you for that, Columba. Marcus, any final thoughts on the subject? Well, just on the on the question of Greeks, is that, and I suppose we'll touch on this as we go on and we push through this series, um, we've given a lot of attention to Magna Greca in the southern part of Italy, and we touched on it a bit with the, the fall of Rome, and we've touched on it sort of today with the the talk about Pyrrhus, and that you have large swaths of Italy, for instance, which um, remain a part of Rome, but ironically, the Rome of the East um, led from Byzantium with the medieval East Roman Byzantine Empire. And you have large parts of, uh, of Sicily, of what is modern day Calabria and Puglia, which are the heel and toe of Italy, respect, uh, respectively, that will be Orthodox and Greek speaking up until the almost the high Middle Ages. Uh, you have uh, the, I mentioned last week, how you had these communities which were set up initially as essentially manpower bases and cultural hubs for the Greeks in the Near East, you know, uh, uh, places such as uh, Emeza and Apamea, uh, Antigonea, Antioch, uh, the Caesarea Mazaka, and we, we mentioned the Pontine cities today. And they were strong points for for the 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 endurance of the of the Byzantine East when the Byzantines lose the Near East of the Arabs in the sixth, seventh century. It's these centers which sort of keep Hellenism intact up until the arrival of the Turks in the in the eleventh century. Yeah. Um, also uh also uh, I, I mentioned too that these Greek communities of the Near East of the Levant are intact until up until the Crusader period. This uh, this is the legacy of what we've been speaking about today. This is how enduring it is. It yeah, goes back I mean, a these, very, these very cities, long time. Yeah, I mean, cities like Antioch become like, you know, bastions of the early church as well, right? Yeah. Yes, exactly. So, yeah. again, this is just uh, just for like um, c continuity. This is the, the third part of our early Greek series. Um, next week, we'll be going over the creation of the, the, well, the establishment of the Byzantine Empire, so the, the dominate, the Christianization, the moving the capital to Constantinople, culminating in the, the reign of the Heraclius. So just, again, to carry on this continuity. Now on to Super Chats, if that's all right. Go for um, it, yeah. We Lord, actually have a few today, which is nice. Yes. Lord Megatron for £10 says, off topic. Christianity liberated the Roman Empire from its last pretense of republicanism allowing it to openly return to monarchy. The Eastern Empire was the real empire if compared to the West. I would dispute the idea that um, Christianity liberated the Roman Empire from republicanism. I think we're all on record as saying that um, the fascinating thing about the Roman Republic in, in, in particular is that from a legalistic framework, there is an unbroken continuity from the removal of Tarquinius. Yeah, the, 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 um, the, the statecraft of the Romans persists in the Catholic Church. Yes, exactly. Any Anyone else want to comment on that topic? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I would say the transition from Republic to Monarchy. Um, um, and I, you know, I like the question, but, but um, the, yeah, the transition to Monarchy... Yeah, it began under you know Augustus, and we've we've discussed these developments. Um, and indeed, and, and, and Christianity um, literally didn't really exist. You know, I and mean, Diocletian, had... indeed, who of course was one of the last great persecutors of um, the Christians. Yes, I yes, think... and I think um, I think in some sense the church, the church represented uh, getting away from because you know there's there's a difference between um, a monarchy that we can get get behind and the kind of monstrous tyranny that the the, the um. The, the dominant represented you know i mean the the emperor is master and god you know it's mm. it's 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 it's, well, it's not a good time the, to be alive <laughs> the, the word dominus you know i mean dominus is not a half-hearted term no, no it's a term for again uh, that, that you know a slave refers to their master as dominus i think so, um in, in just in, in reference to the actual super chat i think what's in uh, i think there's a shade of truth in it but i think what's more more to the point is that you have the arrival of Christianity, which is in, embodied by uh, by Constantine and his uh, and his becoming of emperor. It just so happens that 
the establishment of the dominant, the, re the replacement of the principate of the first first citizen with the dominant and the emperor becoming dominos, the sort of gradual transition as to what the Greeks refer to as the vasileos or the, or the autocrator happens at this time that the Roman Empire also becomes Christianized. I, there might be a shade of truth in the super chat, but I think it just so happens that these two things intersect almost simultaneously in a historical context. Yes, I mean, within, I, I, I would, within a, just one generation, it would all coincide, mm, yes. I mean, I would, argue that, I would argue that the church at that time offered, shall we say, um, it tried to lead people from worshipping this Dominus et Deus to worshipping the real <laughs> Dominus, you know? Sam Peter for five Canadian dollars says, I submit this tithe to aged Methuselah in the name of the lamest Roman statesman, Lucullus, Lepidus, and Bibulus, mediocrity <laughs> in the highest. <laughs> That's great. I mean, the, the, the tribute is accepted. Mm. I mean, we oh, won't, poor, we won't raid your poor, lands this year. Poor, poor Bibulus never gets a break. No. Judge <laughs> Bibulus, Bibulus didn't do anything. Yeah, <laughs> Lucullus, Lucullus wasn't mediocre. Come on. He, defe he defeated um, Tigranes the Great at Tigranicurta. Come on, that's, that's kind of awesome. Yeah, I agree, actually. I'm with you on that, I am. Tigranicurta arguably ranks among one of the greatest Roman, defeat, uh, Roman victories of that century. Exactly. Judge Caligula Bushman has sent a three euro super sticker. I'll see if I can get this up on screen. Oh, I, I don't know how to. No, I see how, it. I see how, it. To, how to. That's awesome. Run. Yay. How to, how to show that is there going to be a little thing because last time there was a little creature behind it i'll see if i can get the um the meaning behind it um there is another little creature saying thumbs up so thank you judge Caligula bushman um we need to try and translate these glyphs later <laughs> yes i don't understand the super sticker but there you are um lady of shallot for four pounds 99 has said Thank you so much for your excellent content. I love your channel. Huge appreciation from a British lass in Melbourne. Best wishes all. Well, thank you very much, Lady of Shalott. It's really kind of you to say that. And um, I wonder, um, I, I wonder if they've named the, their account after that painting, the Lady of Shalott. You know, the 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 um, the was it pre-Raphaelite painting? It's I think a it is the painting. painting. I think it is the painting. Beautiful painting. The, um, if, if you look at the, yeah, I think it is the painting. Oh, there we go. Yep, yep. Yeah, a yeah. Lady of Taste. Thank you very much. Yes. Well, thank well, you very much. And again, it wouldn't be possible well, without I'm my the, wonderful co-hosts. At least I'm not the only Australian here then. I actually feel kind of uh, gladdened by that. <laughs> I'm not the only one up at an ungodly hour. <laughs> right. For $5, we have Endorphin Junkie. You all went to the Triarii on this one. Ah, I like that. I think I think what mm -hmm. he's saying is um um because the Triarii were sort of the last line in, in a Roman yeah. army. So we went yeah. all in. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very um, much. Hey, and before we quit, can we? Uh, I did message you in the private chat. Address that one question, which was addressed to so oh, yeah. me when we're talking about. I'll be very quick though. Yeah, um, sure. uh, let me just actually try and find it. Uh, someone commented about the uh, Th Thorea Feroy um, when we're talking about the Roman uh, interaction militarily between the Diadochi, the 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 rules between the the uh, Macedonians and the Seleucids. What you do see is with the Seleucids a, um, a an attempt to rearm, essentially re-equip the Agriaspides, which is Greek for the silver shields, um, into essentially a sort of pseudo legion unit, and some of the Greek states attempt to rearm some of their uh, Sarasa. Uh, Pesatyroi, the their their foot companions or their phalangites, into essentially so, uh, short sword shield bearing soldiers like the Romans. But the problem is, by the time they realize, or they observe the Romans long enough to realize that sort of warfare is transitioning into this direction, they have neither the manpower nor the finance nor the stability to carry through these reforms in their entirety. And as we've seen through, and we spoke about this at length, obviously with the the the, the conversation about the Gauls the Romans have this very uh, extended tradition of constantly reforming and tweaking and, and when necessary, overhauling their army. The Greeks really after Alexander and, and the reforms of Philip and Alexander don't really do this. They sort of fall, they sort of plateau, they sort of fall into some stagnation. And when they eventually react to the Romans, they're sort of unable to complete this transition before they're 
essentially conquered or they disintegrate in the case of the Seleucids. Yeah, I think I think it's very um, symptomatic of, I mean, this goes back to our very first stream, ma'am, this idea that if you have this ponderous, you know, massive um, empire that is a, is a very um, cruel autocracy, not based on any, um, any, 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 any brilliant unifying ideals, um, things become um, sluggish, um, unworkable, you know, um, um, inefficient in the extreme. Indeed. Now, moving on to final comments. So um, thank you both very much for coming on as usual. Um, anything to show Columba first? Um, I, I am thinking about, I, I put out my article on Boethius. So if anyone would like to read that, it's just a little introductory thing, talking about his life, um, some some first lessons from from his Constellation of Philosophy, his, his most famous work. Um, that's on my Substack, which you can I, I link, um, you can access through my my Twitter. Um, I'm thinking about, um, I've been doing a little bit of research, and I'm thinking about putting out an article um, talking about some of the um, accusations leveled against Saint Thomas More, um, responding to that, um, um, having some some introductory musings on that, perhaps in preparation for. Um, a stream that we could do together. Um, but um, apart from that, um, as always, bitter tweets. Um, if you like bitter tweets, I have many, many of them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, that's me. That's me. Marcus? Uh, nothing to shill at my end aside from the fact that if you uh, fancy following on Twitter, you're welcome to do so. But I'm just, uh, I'm just grateful for everyone who's you know, here to listen and has uh, stayed with us for over two hours. Again, I'm very happy to be here and I, I very much uh, enjoy these conversations and it's a pleasure to be here. So AM, thank you. And to the chat, thank you also. Take care, everyone, and uh, enjoy the rest of your day wherever you are. Thank you. Indeed. So um, like it says here, thank you very much. Thank you very much for watching. Um, again, like, share and subscriptions are, you know, very much appreciated and you can donate through subscribe star if you so wish which is in the description um in terms of like what's happening next on this channel tomorrow um our usual wednesday stream happening tomorrow is going to be on virgil which is going to coincide nicely with the um the topic for today's discussion so we'll be going to the um mythological aspects of that great that greco roman relationship with the um the works of the with the works of the aeneid which will feature Columba here. So very much looking forward to that. On Monday, we will be having our follow-up discussion on this, which will be talking about the creation of the Byzantine Empire. So as I mentioned, dominate Christianization and relocation of the capital to Constantinople, in addition to the fall of the West. On the Wednesday after that, I'll be hosting a conversation with Prudentialist on Bismarck. So hopefully we see you all there for those conversations. Uh, thank you all very much for listening. Thank you to our wonderful guests here this evening and good night. Bye, everyone. <laughs>